right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So we're on to episode four of Jeremy Alvarez TV. And my I have a special guest today. My good friend JB is here. His name says Solio, but ignore that on the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so JB is a hitting instructor for baseball, and he works at the Kappa facility in Fresno, California. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we met and everything, but how are you doing, JB? I'm doing great, man. Just uh, had a great day here at the facility with some kids and some teams. And now I get to talk to the Google of movement, Jeremy Alvarez. So it's always great when I get to sit down and have a conversation with you, man. So I'm glad yeah, to be here. You know, um, I, I'm most excited to do this with you because we've had so many conversations. I mean, you're in there training, you know, some athletes hit teaching them how to hit and everything going through a lesson. I'm over here on the side working with some other kids on, you know, whatever movement training that I'm doing. And, you know, when the night ends and we let everybody out the doors, we have such good conversations together about, deep conversations about movement and the body and coaching and just almost every topic you can think of, which fits perfectly in this podcast. And every time we're like done, it's like an hour into it. It's like, man, I wish I would have hit record on that. Cause there's some, <laughs> so many gems that come out yeah. of that. Right. So uh -huh. let's do this. We finally hit record. We finally decided to do it and let's see what comes out of this. All right. So first sure. I want to start with, um, Let's start with an introduction of you and, and, and what you do at Kappa. What exactly do you do at the Kappa facility? So uh, Kappa is an indoor hitting facility that is owned by Clovis Unified School District here in Central California. Um, it's owned by the district, but it is open to the public. Um, it's indoors with uh, three tunnels. And what we do here is we mainly focus on hitting for softball and baseball. And then we also do team rentals where teams can rent out the facility um, and use it for whatever they want to use it for. Um, my, me, myself, is right now I'm uh, the head instructor here at this time. Um, I wasn't when I got hired, but I worked my way up to be an instructor. Um, so I do pretty much all the private lessons um, and any of the rentals go through me or team practices, um, basically just try to close unified said here, here's this business. And like, we want you to run it and be the face of it. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to turn that down. So I'm here now helping close unified run this as a business and do private lessons and team rentals and all that stuff. So with all the training that we have here. And you guys put out, there's a lot of powerhouse players that come out of that area, correct? Yeah, in this, it's kind of a hotbed in the Central Valley, um, especially with Clovis Unified too. Um, there, there is an extreme amount of good players and the, the schools are just so competitive here. Um, these kids are playing each other at a young age and then they're, all seniors in high school now playing against each other. So they know each other so well. So the games are so competitive. Um, in the track, the league that they play in, you got Clovis West, Buchanan, uh, Clovis, Clovis North, Clovis High, um, Central. Usually in that league, one or two teams is ranked in the state or ranked in the nation somewhere at all times. Like, so it's a super competitive league, but it's also the these here are top notch. Um, the field top notch, the training facilities are top notch. Like this is an indoor turf air conditioned facility for the, yes. the players that come to that, you know, like yeah. and you've been here, you know, you've seen the fields that the kids play at. I mean, mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And uh, Doc Buchanan, the old superintendent from Clovis Unified, that was kind of his, I think his, uh, his dream was in his like look on the school district was if I give these athletes really nice facilities, it's going to make them want to play more and participate more. You know, if you're in the band, 
let's give you a really nice band room. Or if you're in a drama, we're going to give you a nice drama club. Or mm. if you love baseball, we're going to give you the best baseball field we can give you. And it's going to motivate kids to want to go do those things and have those opportunities. And he really loved like you be, becoming a complete student, you know, not just going to school and then going home, but having something to do after school. Like, like mm. said, it, it, if it's band, you're going to have a really nice band room. You know, if you want to play soccer, you're going to have a nice soccer field. If mm. you want to play softball, you have a nice softball facility. Like, so he really wanted the students to be complete students like that. And I think he really felt if I give them really nice facilities to do their extracurricular activities, it's going to motivate them to want to do it more. And I think it's shown, you know, because mm-hmm. a lot of the close unified schools, even in different sports, not just baseball or softball are ranked in the nation or ranked Mm -hmm. in the state. So like, it's a super competitive area, but I mean, it's, it's also a really fun, tight knit, good area filled with good people, good coaches, good communities. Um, I'm, I, I didn't really start out in the Clovis area. I started out in the Fresno. And when I came to Clovis, like it, this was like Disneyland. It was like, wow, you know, this, this is amazing. So I decided to stay <laughs> with <laughs> yeah, I mean, of how nice this is, you know, and that's why many... I took this job. Like, yeah. How can I turn this down? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, There's not many school districts that have the resources that Clovis Unified has. And mm-hmm. it's been awesome to see that the kids actually respond to that. Like you're saying, like, you know, Buchanan's vision uh, and that facility right there, like, there's not many school districts either that would create a facility like that off camp, off any of the campuses on its yeah. own for all the campuses and the school districts to share. And, and then they hire you, uh, you know, hitting coach instructor, you know, a professional for them to come see besides their coach. Like how, yeah. how, how cool is that? So yeah, the school district is very invested into their, uh, kids after school and in my time there i I definitely saw that so one thing i gotta ask you is they hired you as the head they gave you this facility you (laughs) run it you're there after hours right now recording this you have the keys right so they hired they hired you for a reason so could you share with us your coaching framework uh your formula or strategy you know what's what's your approach as a coach when you see some clients? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I guess I'll start with my, my coaching background and like how I got to Kappa um, and got this opportunity to do what I, I love to do what I'm truly passionate about. And I think as a, as a kid, when I was in high school, I put on ESPN one day and it was the NFL combine. And I have always heard about the NFL combine uh, seen clips of it, but I've never sat down and watched the NFL combine. So I decided to sit down and watch the NFL combine as like a 15 year old kid. And my, I was just amazed like on how they could measure athletes. I was like, wow, like I didn't know that you could do this. And then like after the athlete would run a really good 40 or do good on the bench press or any of the the measurements that they do, he would go hug like his, his PT or his strength coach and like super excited. And like, at that time, that's when I knew like, that's what I want to do. You know, like I want to be in the lab helping athletes get bigger, faster, stronger, and stay healthy for their sport. Like that's where my true passion lies. And I think that comes from my dad. My dad's been a, a, a manic for over 30 years and he's at his own auto repair shop for over 30 years and i don't think jeremy we've owned one car that he's just left it alone we customize everything in our family so like (laughs) i think it just runs in my blood you know like when i see an athlete i automatically think all right how can i get him better you know how can i cuss like can i put a new carburetor in him can i change his exhaust system you know like like, I don't just want to lease stock. So I, I, I love coaching, but my true passion and my heart will always lie in a place like this, which I call the lab, where I get to work with athletes and help them and, 
and then send them out to their sport that they play, send them out to their team. You know, that's where my true heart lies. So I, when I saw that on TV as a kid, that I immediately know that's what I want to do. I want to help athletes get bigger, faster, stronger, and stay healthy longer. And around the corner from my house, um, there was a place called Fresno World of Baseball. It was an indoor facility like this that had uh, batting cages, and they also had equipment like bats and helmets and stuff. And I was frequently in there. Um, obviously, as a kid, there's an indoor facility like that um, that had Keith Williams, who was a professional baseball player from the Giants. And then they had Randy Goodrich, who played in the minor leagues and pitched at Fresno State. So those were the, the two guys running it. And I was in there so much that one day they're like, do you just want to work here? Like, <laughs> we need we have a position open. Like, we need someone who's knowledgeable about equipment. I was like, you guys want to pay to hang out with you guys all? Like, heck yeah, I'm in, you know? So at 16, that was like my first job to help sell stuff, um, any customers. But um, they asked me if I would want to start coaching and help with this program. And this program that we had, it was called Bambinos. And it was two times a week for like six weeks. And it was geared towards three to four year olds. And it was awesome. There would be like eight, three to four year olds in this group. And we give them a foam ball and a foam bat and they got a t-shirt. And it was all about just getting them excited about baseball, you know, mm -hmm. and getting them to get addicted to the game. Like mm -hmm. not every parent knows how to show a kid how to put a glove on or Mm -hmm. or how to show a kid how to stand or hold a bat. So I think it was geared towards that also. Like we're here as a resource to help the parents. Like if your kid's interested in baseball and you don't know how to tell him to stand, you don't know if he's left-handed or right-handed, you don't know how to tell him to catch or how to throw, you know, like we were there as that resource too for them. I mean, it, it's, it's three to four year olds. So it was just geared strictly towards fun. Like, and they kind of like trusted me with that. And I'm like, here, like, we, we think you'll be really good at this. And I was super nervous at first. You know, this was my first coaching gig was to run this, <laughs> this thing called Bambinos. And, yeah. and it, it was so cool. Like the kids would come in so excited. And all I felt was if I addicted them to the game and they were going home after my clinic and wanting baseball cards or wanting to go outside and play wiffle ball or asking their dads or moms to take them to a baseball game, then I've done my job. You know, right. I, that's all I was trying to, it was, was I wanted them to associate baseball with fun. And if I could help that, that I feel like I did my job then, you know, it, yeah. and it was some instruction, like, make sure they're standing the right way doing mm -hmm. stuff, but it was just purely geared towards fun. And that, and that was my first like coaching experience that I, I ever got, you know? So I, I did that for about a year. And then as I got older, Keith and Randy kind of approached me and were like, Hey, what do you think about doing one-on -one lessons with like eight to 10 year olds now, you know? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, my biggest fear was I don't want to mess anybody up, you know, like yeah. I don't want to overstep my boundaries. And, uh, but th their confidence in me to do it gave me confidence to do it, you know? And then, so I, I started doing private one-on-one -on -one hitting lessons at this Fresno world of baseball place with like eight to 10 year olds, you know, and I continued to do that. And, gain more confidence in myself and like helping them out and uh trusting myself like hey i i can do this you know like i could i could become a coach this is your passion you know step into your passion and and enjoy it and help kids and still at that age it wasn't so much about instruction it was still i'm trying to be that person that helps addict you to the game you know mm -hmm. that you can associate like you can associate baseball with fun. You know, that's the catalyst that I want to be. So and like I always tell my clients here at Capo, like I want you 
when you get home from school and your dad says, Hey, you have a, a lesson with JV today. I want you to be like, let's go. I'm ready. Heck yeah, I got a lesson. <laughs> like, let's go. Like, that's what I want your reaction to be. I don't want you to be like, Oh man, like I got to go to Kappa today. Like, I don't want that to be the association at all. Like I mm -hmm. want them to associate not only baseball, but this facility, this facility should be geared around development and fun. And that's why we have a ping pong table and a foosball table. And like, when they come in here, it's like, this is a place like, um, it's a safe place for them to kind of let their true athletic ability tell that here they know they're not going to get screamed at like this is just a safe environment for them just to come be themselves and just enjoy themselves that is freaking awesome that is super yeah. that's awesome so i haven't yeah. I, so i haven't got the cap yet so you like i'll, I'll keep going and then well, it, i'll well, try to speed it. well it's, it's it sounds like you know your overall like framework is to make sure that people are engaged and having a good time, especially with the age groups yeah. that you're working with, right? You're working with a lot of kids that you're just developing. You're mm -hmm. not trying to be the coach to coach every single angle of their bat or their feet or their head, like, you know, before, and they're all uncomfortable, right? Trying to hit a ball, right? No, mm -hmm. you're just trying to let them be free flowing and let them discover their own body and their own movement, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then it just kind of happens after that. Like, you know, not everybody pitches the same way in the major leagues. Not everybody has the same hitting stance in the major leagues, right? There's a different thing that works for each individual and their body. And I think that's pretty much how we, how we linked up, right? Where we both were able to kind of hit the ping, the proverbial ping pong back and forth yeah. to each other. Right. Uh, yeah. We had a good relationship with that. Um, I, I actually wrote like, um, I get these ideas and I'll just, get on my phone and start typing and I sent them to my mentor uh Larry Tiger just to get his take on it and I was just thinking like when kids first learn how to walk you know like you're not over their shoulder analyzing their every step and like no you took that step wrong and you should have did it this way and then hey what are you doing you're doing it wrong like when they start walking like us as I'm not a parent yet but Parents like we back off, right? And we're just we're just excited that they're walking. But when all of a sudden it becomes a specialized movement, like a swing or a soccer kick or a throw, now all of a sudden we're over the top of them. You know, like mm -hmm. why? What's the difference between learning how to walk and learning how to hit a baseball? Like, why are we all of a sudden putting pressure? You weren't like that when they were learning to walk. Why are we like that? when they are hitting or throwing because movement is just movement, you know? So walking is movement, hitting a ball is movement. And like when they were first learning to walk, you were analyzing their every step or like over the mm -hmm. top of them on every step or say you're, you're a construction worker, you know, like if every time you hammered a nail, your boss was like right here, <laughs> like screaming at you, like you'd hate your job. Like, yeah. or you so pressured and uptight like you know so like I try to take that mentality into coaching like I'm I'm not trying to like be overbearing like that like you said like I'm trying to just let you especially at that age just be free like um mm -hmm. I, I get a lot of lessons here at Kappa where it just it really feels like these kids are so overcoached and like chained up they just need to like, just, just go with the ball. Like, don't think about what it needs to do or what it is like, like, just go hit. It feels like, um, uh, I always, I always tell my, my kids, like, you guys ever seen the movie, the sound lot? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, so, you know, the dog, right. And the dog's on that chain. I was like, that's you right now. You're the dog <laughs> on that chain. I was like, but what happened when that chain broke? They're like, the dog went running. And I was like, that's what I want you to feel like. Like today, let's break that chain and uh, you just get to be free and just move, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's cause they, you can tell when they've been overcoached or they're analyzed thinkers or overthinkers, they're super tight. They're super perfectionate and, or a perfectionist. And it's like, that's not the time to be there. 
that's not the time to like, you need to be free and move. And there, there's a quote that Tiger Woods, dad said that has stuck with me that when I read was he said that you never really instill anything into a child. You encourage the development of it. But so, I mean, when I heard that quote, I was like, all this stuff I'm saying to these kids, is it really sinking in? No. <laughs> Cause when you like, they're kids man like yeah. when when your kid gets home from school what'd you do today i don't know i don't remember so like when they leave this facility like they're not going to remember every little detail so i'm not trying to really instill these perfected movements into them i'm just trying to encourage their development like that's it that's my goal you know is they encourage the the development not try to instill perfection in them because so, i feel like we instill perfection in them it's harm in their long-term development. So for all you uh, listeners tuning in on this, if you wanted to know what makes JB a unique coach, it's that, <laughs> it, it's, it's that right there, right? Like his approach. And his approach is he understands that, you know, the, the stereotypical coach that you see, right? that parents are telling their kids in the car ride over to, you know, to the Kappa facility to see coach JB, you know, they're already instilled in their head, this image of a coach, like you said, giving them tons of tips and pointers on their stance and how they should be and their grip and, you know, all these details. But what makes JB unique is that he is just creating a safe environment for this kid or for kids to have fun and explore their bodies and to probably learn something new about themselves. Right. And, and from there, the development happens and then you can start fine tuning stuff as you know, Mm -hmm. they get older and they develop more. Um, So that's what I would say. It sounds like, and what I know about you, but what I want the audience to just in summary know makes you, you know, that's what makes you a unique coach, right? Um, it's very special, right? Because uh, if, if kids just want to send, if a parent wants to send a, uh, their child to you, that's what they're going to get. They're not going to get um, somebody who burns them out from the sport, right? Somebody mm-hmm. who just overanalyzes everything they, they do, right? they're going to get somebody that is going to keep their child fully engaged and very excited about being an active person, forget sport. Right. And then number two happen to enjoy baseball. Right. Yeah. Like you're just getting them like a little more addicted to the game. Like if I can help you associate, because baseball is my favorite sport in the world, you know, and I, I think it's the best sport in the world. And if I, if I could help grow the game by getting more and more kids addicted to the game, then I, I'm doing my job the right way. Like, you mm-hmm. know, like I, I, and what I mean by addicted is not like he needs to be in here every day for a private lesson, mm-hmm. or he needs to be playing at every travel ball tournament every weekend. Like um, Mike Matheny wrote a great book that I read early on in my coaching career. Um, I think me and you have talked about it. Um, But he says, like, you know, when your kid's addicted to baseball is when he's asking for baseball cards or he's asking for take me to a baseball game. Or if you come home and he's playing wiffle ball with his friends, you know, like Mm. that's how, you know, like they're really into it, you know. So that that's basically what I'm trying to do is this if I can be that catalyst to help addict them and like wow baseball is actually fun because it baseball is boring like i'm gonna say it's boring at times right it is like <laughs> and especially for kids like you you expect a kid to just stand there and, and wait for another kid to hit the ball and there's so many rules in baseball like okay you can run but you can't run and you gotta wait and if you step off the base he can tag you and at yeah. the ball, like there's so many rules, right? Like, yeah, you get lost. Is a, <laughs> it is a hard sport for kids to understand all the rules. 
And I think that's why a lot of kids first go soccer at a young age, because it's just, it's an easier sport to learn. There's not as many roles. Mm -hmm. And plus in soccer, there's constant action, you know, constant yeah. running and baseball. There's a lot of downtime mm -hmm. and they're just sitting out there waiting for the ball to get hit to them. And in soccer, like go score. That's the right. rule. Don't touch it with your hands and go score. Kind of like, right? like your coaching, right? Just hit yeah, the ball. Yeah. So yeah, it's exactly. like, it's actually yeah, a pretty yeah. good developmental sport yeah. if you would. Right. Like, like, yeah, like d depending on the sport and there's other sports out there, but let's just go along with soccer and baseball for now. It's like okay. soccer is simple, but very complex. It's simple because it's like, yeah, you just got to go score and mm -hmm. you happen to have teammates to help you do that. There's no rules to how you guys can figure out how to get the ball on the other side of the field into the net. So go have fun, like be creative. Mm. And there's so much creativity to it, right. That you can just apply. And um, yeah, obviously kids are just kind of like kicking and screaming. Right. But, <laughs> but that, I think that's like perfect for them just to even like be active. But yeah. once they come see you, it's kind of like, you're like, Hey, this is still soccer. Right. I mean, that mindset yeah. of, you know, yeah, go yeah. go hit the ball like be free don't worry this about be fun too. <laughs> exactly this could be fun yeah. too yeah like you'll get the rules later don't worry just you know yeah hit the ball and run let's just have fun right so that's pretty cool um my, i have a question for you what yes. is the number one frequently asked question that you receive and answer uh it is it, it varies um I, I would say if it's from like another coach, it's what's your hitting philosophy, mm. you know? And I guess like a, a question for you, like if another PT came up to you and like, Jeremy, are you a believer in the carnivore diet or the plant-based diet? Are you, <laughs> Jeremy, are you, a, are you a mobility guy or are you a stability guy? You know, like, right. and it's like, that that's a question I do get a lot. You know, what's what's your hitting philosophy? Mm. You know, what do you teach kids? What do you um, answer? And I I usually answer with you know it's very complex, and each kid is different, mm -hmm. and it's not a one size fits all. So every kid needs to be coached differently based on how they move, how they think, and what they do. You know, so like to try to give like a simple answer. I, I tell them it's, I teach kids to hit the ball really hard and really far. That's what I'm trying to do. There you go. Now, if you want to go in deep with it, it's, um, it's complex, you know, like a lot of, a, a lot of kids learn differently too. Um, mm -hmm. and they need to be taught differently and all of them have different movements in summer biologically this age and some are chronologically this age and like so it's definitely not a one size fits all like mm -hmm. but i am always trying to help the kid maybe not hit it harder so much but hit it harder because if you can hit the ball really hard then you're going to be successful you know so if i can help you hit the ball harder um you're going to be successful you know that, that velo like, so that's that. like a real simple answer yeah, that, yeah. That velo off the bat is pretty important, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it gives the harder you hit it, the harder it is for them to field it. And the mm -hmm. harder you hit it, probably the farther it's gonna go, also. So and the oh. farther it goes, the more successful you're gonna be too. But it's it's mainly, yeah, just I, I teach kids to hit the ball hard and I help them just like whatever their goals are too, whatever they come into with their goals, like what, what are your goals? You know, what do you, mm -hmm. what do you want? You know, cause some kids are just come in for a refresher, you know, some kids want to come in and they need to get ready for something that's two or three months out, you know? So that, that's like a really hard question to ask hitting coaches because there's not really a hitting philosophy because there's no one way to do it. So right. your philosophy is, is no philosophy you know i'm <laughs> yeah. like i'm you know like i it's whatever the the kid needs so that mm -hmm. yeah that's my answer you know what's your hitting philosophy whatever they need 
That's a good one. I think that's a good one. You know, <laughs> and I'm sure you get that question a lot. So Jeremy, you're, you're a special conditioning coach. Um, what's your philosophy on lifting heavy on game day? So I can, it's like, that's a very, that's just, are you ready to sit down and like, listen to this answer? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you, you know, know like, and it's, it's funny because when you say whatever do you believe kid, in stretching journey, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like very, yeah. Those are some frequent questions. I honestly, all those things you just said are very frequent <laughs> questions I get too. So you already yeah. know, um, yeah. but you know, when you say whatever the kid needs, Sometimes the kid needs me. Sometimes the kid needs, you know, an athletic trainer, physical therapist, like a movement specialist. Mm-hmm. They exactly. they need they yeah. need some they need that. Yeah. So um also too, I would say is sometimes kids just need a coach to let them know that they're doing okay. You're not as bad as you think you are. It's mm-hmm. don't don't panic don't freak out. You're, you're yeah. doing fine. Um, one of my mentors, um, when I was getting into this, gave me a book to read called, uh, running on empty childhood, emotional neglect. You know, and it really taught me that when you're neglected emotionally, like you don't know how to deal with your emotions and stuff like that. And it, it really changed my mind on, on how I coach. So when a kid comes in, when I look at the kid or the adult, even like I've had 16, 17 or 18 year old, 19 year olds, guys that play in the minor leagues college. And you, you've worked with moody athletes. Some athletes are moody, you know, like you don't know. All right. What attitude is so-and-so going to come in with today? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't even, the athlete doesn't even need instruction. They just need someone to tell them you're doing great. Mm-hmm. you're right where you're supposed to be and i have a lot of kids that come in here and that's all they need also and i'll just toss to them and give them motivation and and compliment them and then all of a sudden they start hitting the ball better and they think i did a technique change like no like you you just needed someone to tell you you're doing just fine you're that's, right where you're supposed to be. that's coaching you know, man so now, right there yeah, yeah. now when an comes to me when I look at him first and I've never met him I ask myself what does this kid need does he need instruction or does he just need someone to tell him you're doing great you're right where you're supposed to be Mm -hmm. and sometimes most of the time it's just that they need someone just to tell them you're doing great you're Right. right where you're supposed to be you don't actually know how good you are at this game you know and just that little flip will like all of a sudden they start hitting the ball better, you know? And they think Man. like, I did this big instruction change. Like, no, I just helped him believe in himself a little more, you mm-hmm. know? Like, so that's something that's different when they come into cap it too. It's like, I don't go just straight to instruction. I really try to think as a coach, does he need instruction or does he need someone to tell him that, Hey, you're doing okay. You know, also the parents too. The parents sometimes need to hear like, he's, he's right where he needs to be. He's, he's doing okay. He's fine. And then that kind of like relaxes them and relaxes the kid. And now we could just go back to just hit the baseball. Yeah. Sometimes they need that. Cause those benches back there, sometimes the parents are sitting there watching them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're like, they yeah. and you, and you'll notice that, but I mean, the, again, that's what makes you a great coach, right? You are able to f- get the best out of somebody by seeing what they need. So what, again, whatever the kid needs. That's what you said. Right. And it really is. I want to switch gears a little bit. So I want you to talk about, um, how we first met, like what I was doing in this facility. I got a great, I, I remember (laughs) the first day we met. It's so funny. And and then after you share that story, then you can kind of go into a case study or a patient that we worked with together. And then, uh, sure. just to kind of give someone some, give, give the audience some insight is like how, how we combined our powers together to help someone. <laughs> well, <laughs> first of all, I'm, I'm always playing catch up to you. So that's, uh, we got to get that out of the way. Like you're here and I'm just fighting uphill. And then once I feel like I get close to you, you go up a level 
And then I got to try to fight to get back to that level. So I would say your power is definitely golf, like suck in my powers. And I'm just constantly playing catch up. We make each other better. We both. (laughs) You are truly the Google of movement. So um, if they took Gray Cook and Dr. Greg Rose and Dave Phillips and Lee Burton and put those into one person, that would be Jeremy Alvarez, like by far. So that's if you huge... guys don't know who those if you, if you guys don't know who those people are research those people like and if you formed all those guys together that's how you get Jeremy Alvarez that's a but, gigantic yeah, I'll, I'll... gigantic compliment right there <laughs> <laughs> so I'll I'll lead up because I love the day that we met it was so funny so um I was at Frozen World of Baseball right I did the Bambinos I was kind of working my way up the coaching ladder um started doing private lessons. Um, and then as I got towards like 18, 19 years old, um, the owner of that store decided to sell and kind of, he wanted to retire. Um, and then all of a sudden I got this call from Clovis high school, the varsity baseball coach, James Patrick. And he said, Hey, I hear that the facility you're working at is closing down. Would you be interested in come coaching varsity baseball at Clovis high school? And I immediately jumped at the chance, like, heck yeah. I I'm all in like super storied program. It's where I went to high school. Um, the coach is like a legend, right? Like, so it was this, a super easy choice for me to say, yeah. And you want me to go coach on the varsity staff? Like, heck yeah, I'm in. Right. So I show up to Clovis high. Um, and my first job for the first two years was to be the kind of like the assistant backup outfield coach. And the, the head, the head outfield coach on the varsity team was Larry Tiger. And I've never, I didn't never met Larry Tiger before this. So I roll in as like a young, stubborn coach. Like, what do I need to be like this guy's assistant? Like, I, I know how to coach the outfield. Like I, I did lessons at world of baseball, you know, I'm like young, <laughs> dumb, stubborn, cocky coach. Right. Yeah. So like, I, at least I could do is give the guy a chance. So like I show up and Larry Tiger is the most amazing person in the world. Like when he's my boss here at Kappa. And when I walk in, as soon as he hears that door open, he's like, JB, what's up, man. And he's dancing. He's coming in. Like, just think of the most perfect person in the world. And that's Larry Tiger. Like, he's just <laughs> so, awesome. so I don't, I don't know him. I'm, I haven't met him yet. Right. So I'm sitting back and I'm listening to him coach the kids. Right. And in my brain, I think I'm the best coach in the world. I know I worked at Fresno World of Baseball. I'm the best coach in the world. And he starts talking about the outfield. And I immediately think to myself, wow, I don't know a damn thing about the outfield. Oh, Holy shit. Crap. Like, this guy knows way more than me. And I was just dumbfounded. And then <laughs> after that, like, I was in his back pocket every day out there at Clovis High. I was his assistant for the varsity, uh, for the varsity team coaching outfielders. You know, I was in his back pocket, just questions. Hey, why do you do it this way? Because he could explain it way better than I could. He had a reason for everything. He could break it down. Like it was just amazing. And I got to be around him for two years. And every day I was just so pumped to be able to, just to get to be around him every day and just watch how he coaches and how he explains things. And like, he had a reason for everything, you know, it was just so cool. And then, so after two years, he ended up leaving. Um, and then James Patrick was like, all right, well, now these are your guys. You're now the varsity outfield coach, you know? you spent two years with tiger. You're ready for this. You know, like I was nervous, you know, like who am I? I'm nobody, you know, and you're James Patrick. This is Clovis high school. Here's the varsity outfielders. Go take them. Right. And immediately in my mind, I'm like, I don't deserve this. Like, cause I'm I'm not a huge baseball name. You know, I'm not a huge name, but like, if he's trusting me, then there's a reason he's trusting me. He must think I'm ready. So the first thing I did was I bolted to Larry Tiger's house and I said, Tiger, I got to come visit you. I want to know every drill that we did. 
I want to know the name of it. I want to know the reason for it. And I want to know everything about the outfield by the time I leave. <laughs> and he is such a great person. I think it was like the first year the national football game was going mm-hmm. on. And during the national football game, he's watching it and he's helping me. And I'm taking notes like, hey, remember this drill? Why did we do it this way? Why did we... And he's just handing me notes and teaching me and telling me he's going into his room. He's pulling out these old notebooks that he took notes on yeah. and he, and he drew his drills and he's giving them to me. And I'm like, man, like, this is awesome. He was like, he was my Vince Lombardi, you know, he was mm-hmm. like, that showed me everything I know. Like, so I, after that, I became the varsity outfield coach at Clovis high. Um, for another three or four years, I was the varsity outfield coach. I'm trying to remember because I came here to Kappa in 2016. So I, I did the uh, Clovis High. I was the varsity outfield coach for another two to three years. 2014, we were number one in the state. Um, we were ranked, I think, top 10 in the nation. We had a guy go in the first round, Jacob Gatewood, straight out of high school. Um, we got to go to North Carolina where the USA baseball team practices. And we did a tournament there in North Carolina. We got to go to the, the complex where the USA baseball teams, uh, work out at, which was a really cool experience. That's awesome. Um, but what I'll keep saying is, and like, I loved my time at Clovis high. It was awesome. I'll forever be thankful for those opportunities to James Patrick and, the, the Clovis Unified staff and all the guys' assistants I got to coach with. Um, but my heart was always here, was always in the lab. You know, like I loved coaching the strategies, the X's and O's, and like I'm trying to win. Like, and you know, you were with FPU for those years. Like, it's fun, man. It's a camaraderie of guys, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to beat that team, you know? And for some reason, like I love that, but I don't love it as much as I love this. Like I love being in the lab. Like he, when I was at Clovis High, um, my job was the chaperone, the weight room before we started practice, um, practicing or we were allowed to start practicing. And I got paid. So from time school ended to like 4.30, 5 o'clock, they would keep the weight room open after school. And just for any of the kids, students that wanted to come work out or the base players that didn't play football because they got free time and not playing football, they would come work out in the weight room. And I loved being in there. I loved helping those guys get bigger, faster, stronger, teaching them how to lift the right way. Like, I just loved it. I don't know why. My, my heart has always lied in the development lab area you know this is where i love to be but you know never say never i i could go back and coach again i might you know i do miss it as i'm sure you missed it at times like just the camaraderie of guys you know it was fun like you told me stories like that happened when you were coaching and it's like it's just that camaraderie you know it's like the fun like the trying to beat another team and the X's and O's and the strategy and like calling pitches and calling plays. But yeah, ever since I was a kid and I saw that NFL combine, I knew where my passion was. Mm -hmm. And my passion was to be in the PT room, in the weight room, in a facility that's like this and, and working with that athlete to try to get them bigger, faster, stronger. Like this is my calling. So my last After my last year at Clovis High, um, I got approached by Clovis Unified to come run this business and come do this and help run this thing and be the face of it with, guess who? Larry Tiger. (laughs) And, And Keith Williams. Keith Williams was my boss and the guy I got to coach with and hang out with at Fresno World of Baseball. So two guys that I know really well and Clovis Unified saying, hey, we want you to come with them and help run this business that's awesome so how can i say no right like this Mm -hmm. is where i know i belong and i get to be around two guys that i know and respect like i get to see larry tiger every day and ask him questions 
Keith Williams played professional baseball at the Giants. I could be around him every day and ask him questions, you know? Yeah. Let's go. No Let's brainer. Yeah. And, and I remember you telling me that you kind of got into that groove where it was like, I don't want to cuss on this thing because any of my little clients watch this. I don't want to cuss. But <laughs> I'll say the, the, F, the F you mode, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, let's do it. Like, I remember talking to you and you're like, JB, I'm at a surf competition right now. Like, Jeremy, what are you doing at a surf competition? Hey, they needed a trainer. I'm there. <laughs> JB, I'm at a, JB, I'm at a baseball camp right now. What are you doing at a baseball camp, Jeremy? They needed a trainer, you know? Like, so that was kind of my mood then too, was that F you mode, like, yeah, let's do it. You know, like who knows I'm young. Where will it take me? You know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was hard to leave Clovis high. It was hard to leave my athletes. It was hard to leave my assistant coaches that had become so close with. And most of all, it was hard to leave the kids. You know, mm -hmm. it's so hard to leave those guys. You build, such a great relationship with those guys. It was really tough, you know, but it wasn't like I was leaving forever and I was going away. You know, I was still close enough where if they, if I wanted to work with them, if they wanted to come see me, I was here at Kappa, you know? So in 2016, I, I leave Clovis high and I come here to help Clovis unified run this business right. with Larry Tiger and Keith Williams. The dream come and true, right? <laughs> yeah, dream come true, right? Like, and by the way, like, who am I? Like, I'm yeah. not, I'm not a special name. Like, I'm not this ex big league Hall of Fame baseball player, this like big baseball name. I'm just a kid who was very passionate about <clears throat> what he did, knew what he wanted to do at a young age, and knew where I belonged and just took the opportunities as they came you know? Um, so I'm, I'm going to get into how I first met you right here. So like, this is funny. It was funny when I first met you. I don't think Let's you go. know the whole story. So like, so like <laughs> I come to run Kappa, right. And like, you guys have been doing this way before I got here. Like you guys are doing FMS stuff. Like I think you guys are probably the first people in the central Valley doing FMS stuff. Like, and you guys are doing PE and all this stuff, right? So I show up and like, I'm way behind. I don't know anything about this stuff. I've never met you. I've never met Dr. Mo. I've never met, I've only known, I know Keith and I know Larry. Those are the two people I know. So I'm getting ready to close up the store one night and it's cold. And in walks this guy with a hoodie, a beanie, and you had soccer sweatpants on and <laughs> athletic shoes. And you walk straight to the back right here and you just push my cages back. <laughs> in Kappa, we have, I don't know, if people that have never been to Kappa. So we have cages that can, they're on tracks and we can push them back. So we have a turf area to do corrective exercises, um, movements, stuff, stretching, all that. So you immediately just push my cages back. Like you didn't even say hi to me. I own the place. I own like, the place. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. you just walk in. Right. <laughs> and so like, and I'm closing up at the time and I'm like, is this, does he think this is the indoor soccer place? Cause the indoor soccer place <laughs> next door, like he came in with like soccer gear on, you know? So I was like, maybe he's confused. And like, so I immediately run to the back and I call Larry Tiger and I'm like, Hey, this guy just came in and I don't know if I should ask him to leave or like, I don't know who he is. And he's like, what's he look like? And I explained, he's like, Oh, that's Jeremy. That's one of Dr. Moe's guys. I don't know who Dr. Mo is. I don't know who Jeremy Alvarez is. So like, and Larry's like, he's okay. He has a key. That's one of Dr. Moe's guys. He's fine. Just let him be. Right. Yeah. And so I come back out here and I, I've kind of heard about Dr. Mo a little bit. I knew he was like this movement guru guy that like just tons of information. Like he's like a, like a great cook or Dr. Greg Rose or like he's, he's those guys, you know, mm -hmm. he's that caliber. And uh, so I'm like, whoa, well, this is one of Dr. Mo's guys and he must know some stuff too. It's so like, so I come out to introduce myself and I look in my turf area over here 
and you have these chains with <laughs> you and you're crawling, you're crawling sideways. Something I've never seen before. Right? <laughs> and, like, and you're crawling sideways with these chains. And I'm like, I thought this guy was a strength and conditioning specialist. This is how <laughs> d- like dumb and stubborn I am. I have no clue about this stuff. You know, I come from like, let's eat steak and like lift heavy. Like so yeah. this guy's a specialist and he's crawling on the ground. Why is he crawling? And he has chains hooked to him. Who hooks <laughs> chains to them as they crawl? You know? <laughs> So you, you get it done. Like I let you finish. And I'm like, I got to introduce myself to this guy. <laughs> so like I come up and I'm like, Hey, I'm sorry, man. I had no idea who you were. Like I was about to kick you out or whatever, you know, like, and you introduce yourself and I introduce myself. And like, we start talking and all of a sudden you, I, I don't know if you were, I know you were at FPU, but I don't know if you were still on the baseball staff or not, or if you were just teaching or going to school, but I know you were still at FPU at the time. And so, and I was like, wow, that's cool. And then you dropped the bombshell. I'm from Corpus Christi. And I'm like, what? That's where my family's from. Like, <laughs> just like the movie serendipity where like, this is destiny right now. Like <laughs> you were supposed to like meet in this moment. Like what are the odds of two guys from Corpus Christi that don't know each other, meet each other in Clovis, California of all places, <laughs> not LA, not San Francisco, yeah. Clovis, California, right? Like yeah. that ties to the Corpus Christi. I'm not from there, but that's where my, my grandparents and my whole dad's side of the family lives. Right. Yeah. And like, I was like, Holy crap. Like, dude, like I said, like, this is destiny, man. Like we were <laughs> supposed to meet each other. And I, I remember like every time you would come in, like you would crawl. That's all you would do. <laughs> like you would come in, you would push my cages back, you would grab those chains or the the battle rope, and you would crawl sideways, you would crawl front to back, and then like, see you, JB. And I'm like, is this dude do do anything else besides crawling? Like, <laughs> what is it with all the crawling? Like I never saw you do a curl, a press, a squat, uh, nothing. Like you would come in every night and just crawl. Like, and that's how ignorant I was. I didn't know how beneficial crawling was. You know, like I said, like I'm constantly playing catch up to you guys. So I come to Kappa, you, Larry Tiger, Keith Williams, Dr. Mo, you guys are doing this FMS stuff. You guys are doing this mobility, corrective exercises, um, stability, you know. I have I don't know about this stuff yet. I'm playing catch up. So I'm looking I'm like, oh, like this is weird. You know, like he just crawls. That's all he does, you know? Like, and that was all you did every single night. And like finally I got a night where me and you got to I got to lock you down and talk to you and, and just start asking you questions. And the information you were feeding me, my head was just exploding. Like I was like, I got to have this guy in my posse. Like, this is the guy I got to have around me. Like at that point in my life, um, what was it like two or three years ago we met, right? Like um, I was kind of starting to build a gang of people around me. Like I wanted to be around really smart, intelligent people. Like as many Elon Musk as I can be around, that's what I want to be around, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I heard you talk and I was like, holy, this guy, man if I ever hit the lotto and bought the Dodgers, he would be the first guy I hire. And I would tell him, <laughs> to that's how informational this guy is and how smart he is, you know? So I'm like, heck yeah, Jeremy's on my team. I got him now. And then two doors down, we have a chiropractor, Dr. Joe Martin. Um, he used to bring his kid into Fresno world of baseball. He, he moved in two doors down. Awesome. Now I have a chiropractor I can talk to too, you know, like I said, I'm nobody, but I'm hungry for information. I, mm-hmm. I want to get better. I want to be a better coach for my clients and for my facility, you know? So now I, I have a chiropractor two doors down. I got Jeremy Alvarez who comes in and crawls on a nightly basis and I <laughs> you know, ask him any question I want, you know? That's uh, so, so funny. I, I finally get to meet Dr. Mo. I got Dr. Mo on speed dial now. Um, yeah. n- now all of a sudden this guy named uh, Juan comes in, you know, Juan is 
a mutual friend of ours who the smartest guy I've ever met about the brain, you know? So like, I'm starting to build this team around me. I got Juan who knows everything they know is about the brain and how it helps the body move and everything, everything about the brain, man. That guy is so smart. I love that guy. And I got Jeremy Alvarez, the Google movement. And then I got Dr. Jill Martin, who is a chiropractor. And if you're going to be a chiropractor, you got to know something about the body. I got, <laughs> yeah. you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mo, who is your mentor, you know? Um, and then I got Larry Tiger and Keith Williams too. So like, I'm starting to build this team around where me and like, I can ask questions and I want to learn about the body because I'm starting to learn hitting is movement. So it needs mm -hmm. to be taught like movement. And I wanted to learn how does the body work throughout the swing? You know, like what muscles are used? What body parts are used? What is the sequence of events that happens? You know, right. and Larry Tiger was awesome and just feeding me books. He just started giving me these books to read this book, read this book, read this <clears> book. <throat> and it just, blew my mind when I started reading these books and I started talking to you and I started talking to uh, the chiropractor, Dr. Joe Martin and, and Dr. Mo and like all these guys. And like, I almost felt like I was cheating, you know, as a coach, I was like, wow, like you guys know this stuff. Like, and you guys have been doing this for how long? Like I need to, I need to get on your guys's level. Now I don't have like, a doctorate mass. I don't have all these degrees like you guys had, but I was hungry for information to become the best coach that I could be. You know, mm -hmm. I, when clients come into Kappa, they're taking their career and they're putting it in my hands and saying, here, JV, this is my kind of like my livelihood. This is the way I'm going to put books on the table in college. If I get drafted, this is how I'm going to pay my bills. This is how I'm going to put food on the table and I'm trusting you with this. So if they're trusting me with that, I'm going to treat that with as much care and as much respect as I can. And in order to do that, I need to go learn as much as I can about how the body works and how it moves. So that way, when we have our time together to work, we're working on the right things. Right. We're doing what we're supposed to do. So I'm not wasting your time and you're not wasting my time. So I got to learn and question Jeremy Alvarez, like our late night talks. I'm calling you at midnight and you're like, damn, JB's calling me like, and a million questions, right? And like Dr. Uh, Joe Martin, the chiropractor, like, um, just, hey, I'm trying this with the kid. What do you think about this? Or like, okay, the, the pelvis moves like this and lumbar and the thoracic spine, like, and all this cool terminology and by the way when me and you first met and like i would talk to you and you would use like this terminology i would go home to my wife who's a speech therapist right so she has a lot of the kind of like anatomy books and like fine motor skill books because she's a speech therapist yeah and i was like, they were like this guy is so smart and i know what he's telling me is really good stuff i just don't understand the big words that he's using <laughs> what i what i but I want to, I yeah. want to, I yeah. want to be able to speak the language. I want to speak Jeremy's language. You know, <laughs> I want to speak Dr. <laughs> Mo. I want to speak the chiropractors. Yeah. Like Larry, I want to speak the language. So then I got to work and I just started reading. And so when you talked about the <clears> pelvis <throat> internally rotating, I know what that meant. Mm. You know, when you talked about the thoracic spine doing this or like, uh, is the lumbar spine doing this? You know, what, like I, I, I started to understand these words. So right. um, I could have a smart conversation with you, not just asking questions, you know? And I, I was reading a book a month, you know? I was reading anatomy books. I was reading uh, golf books. I was reading biomechanics books. I was reading all these books because I was just so hungry for information at that time, you know? Yeah. And reading a book a month for me is like a huge thing. I'm sure you probably read like a book a week, like <laughs> you're, <laughs> you know, and yeah, that I was, mean, that was, that was another thing I noticed too, was like 
Dr. Mo was always giving me books to read too, right? Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mo, like, what does that guy not know? And he's still willing to learn, right? Like Mm -hmm. he's still reading books. Jeremy Alvarez is still reading books. And to me, you're the Google of movement. Uh, The chiropractor, two doors down, he's still reading books about how the body moves. Like Larry Tiger, they're still reading books. So I was like, I need to become a reader too. You know, if those guys are still learning, then I still need to learn. But the only thing is I was way behind the curve. So I had to go at like a real fast pace. So I just started smashing books, asking questions, learning information. And I wanted to build this team around me uh, as a baseball hitting coach where I had you as like a resource. I had uh, Dr. Joe Martin, the chiropractor two doors down as a resource. I had, if I ever had any questions about the brain and how it worked, I had Juan as a resource. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had all these people that I wanted to surround myself with, you know, so it it forced me to get on your guys's level, you know, and it helped me as a coach and it helped me sleep better at night, knowing that when I worked with my client, we worked on the right things. You know, we, we kind of did, we did the right stuff today, you know, like, and I am becoming the most, like I am becoming as intelligent as I can be for my client. You know, and I feel like that's showing them a lot of respect. You know, like I said, they're handing their careers over into our hands as coaches Mm -hmm. like me and you, you know, and I treat that with a lot of respect. You know, I'm not going to watch you swing and be like, yeah, it sounded good. Let's go home. Yeah. You know, right. Like I, I, I'm not going to be one of those coaches. Like, so I, I really pushed and like, I'm going to surround myself with smart people. And I'm going to try my hardest to get on their level. You know, that way I know how to coach hitting. I know how to coach throwing from a movement perspective, Mm -hmm. not just, Hey, this is what I was taught when I was a kid, you know, no, it, it, it's a movement. It might be a specialized movement, but I'm going to learn how to teach it the right way. You know, not not necessarily the right way, because is there really a right way? But like how the body actually works, you know, teaching it from a movement Mm -hmm. perspective, I guess, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. I mean, what what I wanted to finish on was asking, um, you know, any advice you have like for coaches and things like that. But honestly, you've kind of already said it already, right? If people, the audience has tuned in and is listening to JB speak He's already given you so many little tips and advice, right? Uh, Early on in your career, you decided to equip people that had little nuggets information that you knew was important, but didn't know much about. So you went out and you had an F yes attitude, like you talked about earlier, and you went out and educated yourself. You worked hard on your off time to learn more about what you needed to learn so you could come back to the people around you to learn more and expand your philosophy, expand your knowledge on the game and expanding your knowledge on coaching an individual by showing them respect, by giving them the best coaching possible, you had an open mind. So you were willing to learn from these people of different professions. You're willing to read about other sports. You're willing to, you know, read about all these different, um, techniques or things that have been around, but you just didn't know about. So it could have been, it could have been easier for you to just continue doing what you've always done, but you had such an open mind and such a drive to learn more that, you know, look at you now, you're, you're the head of uh, hitting at the Kappa facility now, right? You're the head of your dream. You had a dream that being in the lab was your true love. And look where you're sitting right now, right? Like you work so hard to get to do what you love. And now you not only do that, but you're really good at it. So how awesome is that, right? So I think, you know, you don't even have to answer it. You already did. 
But your biggest advice is to just have the drive and have an open mind. And whatever your dream is, you know, be ready for the opportunity because you will get the phone call if you've been doing these things to, hey, do you want to work at Kappa? Right. And when the opportunity calls, you got to be ready with the mindset and the knowledge to perform the duty, to accept the opportunity. And you were ready. It's awesome. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, I, I always had the passion. I knew what I was passionate about. Um, and, and it's not like, I'm like popping in, like, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for Kappa. I know that's like, there is a little bit of fear in there, you know, like, am I ready for that? Like, am I ready to be the face of that business or run that business or take over or, mm-hmm. or, go am i am i ready to go to the next level in my coaching career you know like me and you i know like where you started and how you've worked your way up the ladder to get to where you've gotten and it is scary you know like am i am i ready for that you know and i just try to study and network as much as i can and go into it with an open mind like even if you don't agree with what that coach is saying or doing, you know, he might be able to say it in a different way. And you're like, wow, like I never thought about it that way, you know, or like, I'm, I'm going to teach it to my kids that way, you know, mm-hmm. or you might have a kid who, who, who's on this end of the spectrum and needs it and an extreme drill to help get them back. You know, like I, I wish I would have broken down my stubbornness and my cockiness earlier. And if I could go back and tell the 16 year old JV that wanted to be this coach that has a facility to Kappa basically just said like, here, here's a facility, do with it what you will, you make it what you want to make it, you know? And they gave me this to like, Hey, you do like, so like, I wish like I would, I would tell myself at like 16 years old, 17 years, old, it's okay to be a nerd. You know, it's okay. It's okay to read books. It, it, it's okay to, to not know it all and to, and to like go up to other coaches. And I think in my mind, I don't know why I always had this stigma. Like I always thought like, I'm trying to think of a different word to use, but like, I always thought like, like Dr. Greg Rose was like a mean guy, like, you know, or Gray Cook was a mean guy. Like, I can't just go up to Gray Cook and like, Hey, what do you think about this? Like, or, um, you're a really good friend, um, who's associated with T guy who has like the jungle oh. gym outside. Uh, Milo. Yeah. Milo dude. Like, I've learned so much from that guy too. And like yeah. his Instagram, right. Mm-hmm. That's another guy, right. That is just awesome. Like, so like seeing him like on Instagram or social media or YouTube or podcasts and Gray cook and, uh, Lee Burton, Dave Phillips, um, Mike Boyle in my brand. I'm like, I don't know why I thought those guys were like, they're mean, like, or they're, uh, stingy with their information yeah you know and that's so far from the truth it's not even funny like when i got a chance to get fms certified like gray cook is willing to give out his information and talk to people as long as you're like willing to listen Mm -hmm. and i when i was getting fms certified and like listening to that i did it online because it was during the pandemic and like I put the, I was doing it online. So it's like videos. I put it on subtitles and I wrote down word for word, what great cook was saying. Like <laughs> his, his information was like, Oh my God. Like, dude, this guy is amazing. Like he's cheating. How does he know this stuff? How, yeah. does, how, do, how do you guys know this stuff? Like I want to know this stuff. So what I did was I went and reprinted my binder because you got to print out your own binder and i gave myself three extra pages 
for every note taking page because that's how much I was taking notes. Yeah. I was overusing my note taking pages, and <laughs> he was just drop, <laughs> dropping some movement bombs. And I'm like, whoa, dang man! Like, and same thing like when I hear Dr. Greg Rose speak at TPI, you know, he just drops these bombs where it, it's almost too like where you're at times like how do you know this stuff man like dude like you could probably make like, you could you could probably make a social media account with like every post is just one of the these gem of a quotes that they drop yeah, yeah, cuz like yeah. they're they're full of them man like i think mm-hmm. that's like you know like there's a lot of good clinicians out there very knowledgeable people mm-hmm. a lot of them let me tell you right now but those guys have an edge on their side for some reason they are so good at articulating what they see and mm-hmm. i know a lot of super smart people that are not very good at that but man that i think like their gift of speaking and articulating what they what they're trying the information they're trying to transfer is probably better than their knowledge of the body honestly yeah. like yeah. their words and analogies they use are insane and i find myself learning from that and using a lot of the same stuff so um, and i know is it um is it i, I want to not get his name or i never want to disrespect him is uh milo or milo 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 mm-hmm. like that guy too man like i just follow him on Instagram and like he puts up some awesome information and he has put up some videos like like and, and parents don't believe me when I talk about his facility I'm like this guy just basically has a huge playground mm-hmm. like it's a huge playground that he plays with the kids and mm-hmm. then they go hit golf balls yep I that's what I want Kappa to be mm-hmm. it's a huge playground and then we hit some baseballs you know right but so normal people outside of the development and the stuff like that like that doesn't look like that's going to get somebody better you know yep, right yep, like yep. you go to you go to um milo's place and you like you're wow you have a jungle gym and you have a driving range like <laughs> how how do i take you seriously right like, yeah but like in reality like that's the best place you could go to. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Right? Like, that is by far like he, he's the Dr. Dre, right? Like <laughs> he's the Dr. Dre, right? Like he's the guy you go to when you have failed at all these other places, like, yeah. because he's the Dr. Dre of facilities. Like, yeah. And then he also certifies and does like a certification program too. Right. Doesn't he? Oh yeah. Yes, he yeah. does. Like, yeah. He has a clay certification. Yeah, Co- coalition for launching active youth mm. and um he works with kids down in san diego don't worry i'll have him on for a future episode yeah um, I, and i can't wait to listen to yeah. that because that, that guy also is he's like great cook dr greg rose he's up there like if i could ever if i ever get, can get a chance to hear him speak i'm gonna take advantage of it and i'm gonna bring a huge notebook you know like i'll I'll take that guy out to dinner and buy him whatever he wants, just to him to answer some questions, you know? Oh shit. I might I'll tell him the most, <laughs> yeah, buy him the most expensive steak in the world, like any, anywhere he wants to ask him like 15 questions, you know? Throw him a massage, man. And he might leave San Diego to go, to go visit for us now. <laughs> yeah. And he just, he's another guy too, where it's like, you know, him better than I do. I've never really got to actually met him. I just see him on social media and I know, you know, him really well, but like nicest guy in the world, I bet. Right. Like, and not stingy with his information. Like if you're a young coach, who's willing to not be stubborn and humble yourself and put your pride to the side and go, Hey man, like, can I ask you some questions? And I want to learn from you. I bet he would be willing to teach you everything just like how dr greg rose does it and and great cook and lee burton and Boyle and like i don't know why in my head i i have these guys like man those guys are probably dicks like they probably they don't want i'm nobody so they don't want nothing to do with me you know yeah. like 
And it was when I broke down my pride and put my pride to the side. You're like, you know what? I'm going to go get FMS certified, you know? And, and I'm going a, I'm to a send Dr. Gross messages. And I'm going to send Gray Cooks some messages. And I'm going to send the FMS people and, like, see if I get a reply. And you know what? I got replies. I got questions answered. I The FMS thing was amazing. If you are wanting to get into coaching and any sort basketball football uh golf a swinging sport and you don't know if it's for you or not i really recommend the fms certification it's so informational it is um not very expensive and they have times where they have special deals um, where it's like half the price or something like that um it, it it's just it's a great learning tool you know mm-hmm. um i and I think it was like the very first sentence that uh, Cook spoke was um, Gray, Gray Cook, right? Like, mm-hmm. is that, that's his name. To, it's him and Lee Burton are the two guys, right? So, like, he gets on there, and obviously, first is do no harm, right? Mm-hmm. And then he, he, he like dropped this bomb of a quote, was like, I hope I don't butcher it, and I, ho- I hope you remember it. But he said, we will never be able to do it better than nature, but we might be able to do it faster and more efficient. And I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> is, uh, Dude, he's full of those, man. He's full yeah, right? of those. Like, quotes. Yeah, it's and crazy. Like, that was like, I, I almost like woke up my wife and I'm like, you got to hear this. <laughs> like, we will never be able to do it better than nature but we might be able to do it a little faster and more efficient. Yeah. And I'm like, so then that goes back to my youth teaching now. Like, you know, so why am I going to try to do, when I'm helping these kids, why am I going to try to do it better than nature? Yeah. Right. If I can't do it better than nature, why am I going to try to do it better than nature? The blueprint's already there. Yeah. So you know what? I'm going to find out what, what helps you know, what's been the biggest factors in, in development and kids and athletics and in general. And then I'm going to use my technology. I'm going to use my resources that I have to help teach those better. You Mm -hmm. know, one thing I've really gotten into lately is because I've read so many books now, now I'm kind of going backwards. I've started reading like really old golf books and I've started, um, it, it was after I read the book Range by David Epstein or Epstein. Epstein. Oh yeah, excellent. If you're if you're a parent or you're a coach, especially if you're a parent, I know Doctor Mo said he gives that book to to like every parent of the <laughs> yeah. client that comes and sees. You know, yeah, that's an amazing book, right? Or yeah, that book is crazy. Gene, like those two books are like, if you're a coach, those should be in your office. Like, mm-hmm. so after reading those books, like I was like man like i want to go and read like how did really old golfers get so good without all this technology and all this medical science that we have now you know Mm -hmm. how did usain bolt get so fast i'm sure growing up where where he grew up he didn't have a nike spark parachute and ladder no you know like i've read about cristiano ronaldo from Portugal and who's probably is going to go down as one of the best soccer players of all time. All the Lionel Messi fans are probably booing me right now. Or hating me, but, <laughs> um, but like he in Portugal grew up very poor, right? Like mm-hmm. take fruit off the tree and go play right barefoot probably like, you know, so how did Cristiano Ronaldo get to be one of the best soccer players in the world without all this technology around him at such a young age, you know, without right. a Nike spark ladder, without, you know, um, video analytic data, like without all this stuff, you know, how did Bo Jackson become the athlete he became without a hit tracks, right. without a track, man, without, um, without a K bus mm-hmm. to see if, Bo Jackson was in sequence when he was hitting, you know? Um, 
so that that's what I've been doing lately is is reading those guys' biographies um, or just like really old golf books from like golf instructors from a really long time ago. And what did they teach back then? You know, mm-hmm. like how did they help golfers become so good without a track man, without video analysis, without a K vest, you know, because they basically just had nature, you know, like. So I'm really studying that a lot. Like how did those guys get so good without this stuff? And then, like I said, I'm going to use my resources to help teach those better. You know, I'm going to use my technology that I have at hand to teach those better. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try, you know, like, but the key is, is, is finding out like, how did they get so good? How did Bo Jackson become the athlete he became without all that stuff? you know, or how did Usain Bolt become so fast? You know, how did reading those David Epstein books, that's, that can get you down that rabbit hole because, (laughs) because he talks about, he talks about Jesse Owens, you know, and running on the track that he ran on. It was like that dirt Rocky track that didn't have good traction. Mm -hmm. His shoes didn't Mm -hmm. have great traction, you know, like he didn't train with any of those things. So like they were saying that like, yeah, Jesse Owens looks, Looks Jeremy, like his... I'm reading that book, and then as I'm, I just started the David Epstein Rain book, and yeah. then Greg Gray Cook just drops that quote on me at the same time. So I got that <laughs> quote. We can do it better in the nature, you know, but we might be able to. Do it. And then I'm reading this book at the same time, and it's just like, <sighs> so it bombs, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, exactly. and so yeah, he just talks about that, and it's like yeah by the number jesse owens is slower and his records have been broken right by people today but the track that people are running on today the footwear people are running on today are much different than Mm -hmm. it was then and if you you know they can't do it for sure but if you took all those things away from them or you added it to Jesse Owens, they'd probably be neck and neck or he'd probably still be faster or just as fast. Mm -hmm. So it's not that like, it's not that he argues that in a lot of ways that it's not that our athletes are bigger, faster, stronger. It's just that, you know, the fields and environments that we compete in and the rules that change through different eras is what makes us bigger, faster, stronger. Like the the Olympic pools, for example, he also talks about that where like, you know, the waves of the the swimmers it used to hit the sides of the pool and then come back and hit them and it created more drag. Now the Olympic pools and the waves go, they just the the pool deck is level with the the water line. And so it flows over and the waves don't come back to the swimmers. So yeah, it's going to make them faster or, you know, the suits or the swim caps, like amazing that someone would go that into detail and like be passionate enough to think about the waves in a pool. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But then you, then you think about it, you're like, Whoa, it makes sense. Never thought about it. It (laughs) makes sense. Right. Yeah. So it's just like things like that. Right. It's like, yeah, we're making them bigger, faster, or, or, or I guess he's asking the question, are we really making them bigger, faster, stronger, mm-hmm. you know? Are we doing it better than nature? Like, Yeah, it's like, no, we're all, we're pretty much at the same level. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they were healthier. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really good as, as a coach to like, to learn about like read the I, there's i think there there's substance in the old books you know like yeah information has advanced and we have cameras and we have technology that can prove stuff that they didn't have back then um but there, there's a reason why bo jackson became such a great athlete without mm-hmm. all that stuff you know there's well, a reason why mickey mantle was one of the best hitters of all all time. Babe Ruth. Um, You look at the old golfers like Arnold Palmer and um, Jack Nicholas, and like, they didn't like now today we have a vest that you can put on. It's called a K vest. And like it sings to a song. All right. If you are out of sequence, it goes, "Ah." if you're in singlets, it goes, like imagine, if Tiger Woods had that at 16 years old, but he didn't, 
So since he didn't have it, what did he do? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. You know, and that's what I'm researching and learning, like before all this stuff that we had, what did they do that made them so great? And there's one thing I love about Milo that he really preaches. And I've started to really preach it here at Kappa is teach your athlete how to sprint the right way. Mm -hmm. That is one of the first things that you should do. You know, if, if your athlete doesn't know how to sprint, if he doesn't know how to run fast, how's he going to know how to swing fast? Oh, yeah. You know, like still Can't do it. Yeah. Right. And I think that is something to learn. Like when you look at like Cristiano Ronaldo, like I bet when he was six years old, he knew how to run fast. Huh. He knew how to sprint fast. Right. He probably Guaranteed. didn't know, you know, right. Like I bet Bo Jackson could run really fast. I bet like, um, obviously Usain Bolt, obvious he could run really fast. <laughs> you know? Um, but I, 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 as like listening to uh, Milo talk and like, he, he's big on that, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, cause you know how you asked me the question, what is the question you get asked a lot? And he always gets asked uh, a certain question that he posts a lot. He's like, I always say teach your athlete to run fast or that's, you know, can you run fast or teach them to run fast? You know, that's a huge mm-hmm. thing. And that's a huge thing that I've learned here at Kappa is like, Kids are afraid to move fast for some reason. Are this generation of athletes are very careful movers and they're very perfect movers. And it, it, it hinders their development so mm-hmm. much. And I, I try to make those kids realize that when they come in, like, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I would go back and change on me is I wouldn't have tried to make eight to 10 year olds or 12 year olds, or even 13 to 15 year olds. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I would have waited on the perfectionism, you know, and the kids I get in, it's like, I I don't know if it's, they've been overcoached. So they have all this technique. I don't know if it's, they're so scared. If they miss, they're not going to get to play the next inning or they're going to get yelled at by the coach or Mm -hmm. something like that. Like, they're just so afraid to go fast, you know, and it's, I'm just constantly encouraging them in here, like go fast. Like this is a safe place for you to go fast. Right. Cause if you miss, so what? Like Dave Roberts, the coach of the Dodgers is not in here right now. You know, yeah. like the, the owner of the Lakers is not watching you train right now. You know? <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you miss, nobody cares, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's, it's okay. You know, yeah. I'm trying to free you up and like, I don't know why, like it, I just, if it's all the information that's at hand. So coaches are like, wow, like I need to hurry up and, and get him to disassociate and get him to be in proper sequence and, mm-hmm. and get him to have proper mechanics and, and like, it's this, even when I do like a FMS test or an engine test on my athletes that come in, like what I see a lot of is weak cores and tight hips. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of tight hips and I see a lot of weak cores and a lot of careful movers. And the first thing is I ask the kids is why are you afraid to swing fast? And their first response is, cause I don't want to miss. Mm-hmm okay, well, what's going to happen if you miss your mom and dad are still going to feed you dinner tonight. Like I promise, (laughs) you know, like it's okay if you miss, you know? So it's like, I, it's really hard to get parents to understand that concept of we don't want him to be perfect yet. You know, like it is hard. And, and then, and then it's, you got to go into the whole thing of like, Hey, we have a window of opportunity to develop speed, strength, and power. And parents don't want to hear that, you know, no, like, no, they, they want to see, to they want to see him win. <laughs> yeah, they want to see him right? score. They want to see yeah. action. They want to see yeah. results. Like results. Now. Yeah. Now it's like, right. it's like, mm. like, and 
it, I, and I try to be energetic and like um, be funny with it. Cause maybe if I be funny with it and energetic with it, it'll kind of like make them want to learn it more. And instead of just being like, no, he, he needs to do it this way. And I'm like, <laughs> like yeah. this coach tense, right? Like, I don't yeah. want to. Okay? So if I kind of just be light <laughs> with it and like, I always use this story. Like I, if the kid's like eight years old, right? Like I'll tell him, Hey, I can make you the best eight year old in the world. We can do that right now if you want. Right. And then I always ask him, if you can tell me who the best eight year old baseball player is in the world, I'll make you better than him. So, but you got to tell me who the best eight year old baseball player is in the world. And they're like, uh, I don't know. And I'm like, why don't you know? Because nobody cares. Nobody cares who the best eight year old in the world is. No. Right. Like, no. And, or like, I'll ask him who won the little league world series last year. I don't know. I don't remember who won the world series. Oh, it was this dude, Dodge red braves whatever you answer it like that like i'm like why do you think you remember that and you don't remember this yes because nobody cares, right yes, like yes yes that shouldn't be that shouldn't be your goal you know so when they come in and i tell them i'm like look like say you're a lawyer someday right and you have this nice office and your friends come to take you out to lunch and you have this plaque on your wall and your friends walk in your office and they're like what's that plaque and you're like, well, when I was eight years old, I was the best baseball player in the world. And they gave me the plaque. Like, do you want that plaque? Or do you want the plaque that says, hey, I got drafted? Or, yeah. you know, like I, I won a D1 College World Series championship with my mm -hmm. team. Or like, you know, I made my varsity baseball team. Or I won a Valley championship. Mm -hmm. Which plaque would you rather have? You know? Right. You want the I was the best eight year old in the world, or do you want to make your high school varsity baseball team someday? Do you want to try Dang. to play college sports? Do you want to play in that? Like you know, they, so do they like, usually they, respond and, to that? Yeah, they they laugh, they, they giggle, right? Like they're yeah. like, yeah, like yeah, that when makes I was sense. eight years makes old, sense. like I, <laughs> I was the best in the world. Like, is that yeah. the plaque you really want to have in your office? You know, like no, like so. It, it's it's getting them to understand that and it, it's really hard I, I, i'm learning the verbiage and how to say it and how, and just how to get parents to understand development you know mm -hmm. it's and that's what we're about here at kappa we're about development you know and i'm not trying to make you the best eight-year-old in the world i'm not trying to make you the best 10-year-old in the world you know um and, and that's why i think some people some people don't like us. Some people don't want to come to Capit, you know, because we're, we're just not that facility that you come in and I'm going to sprinkle some magic dust on you and you're going to go ball out, you know, yeah, it's, you're good it's immediately. A, yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a process because I'm more worried about your long-term development than I am about you winning the firecracker classic this weekend. Early, you know, right. All uh, yeah, the all the all world eight year old soccer championship. You know, like um um when you come into Kappa, you now become family, and we get a personal relationship with the coach and the athlete, and we we are now going to go on this journey together. You right. know, I'm not just working with every eight year old out there and every nine year old out there and every 12, because that's not what this place is about. You know, this place is about development. So if I was to take on a million clients, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I do have to turn some people down, you know, mm -hmm. because I want my relationship with my athletes to be personal. I want them to know that when they're with me, they have my undivided attention, you know, and we are, I like the way Mike Boyle says it, like you want to stay in the crock pot. You know, there's a difference between a microwave and a crock pot, you know, and as an athlete, you want to be in the crock pot. If I throw you in the microwave and I try to cook you too fast, injury happens, burnout mm. happens. You might quit, you know, mm -hmm. but if I slow cook you in that crock pot and plus like this food tastes better in the microwave is food tastes better out of the crock pot. Mm -hmm. Definitely crock slow cook. Pot. 
that yeah, right. Slow so you're trying to slow cook athletes, mm -hmm. you know, like, and that's what I'm about here at Kappa. You know, I'm not about how many clients I can have, you know, how many lessons I can do in a week. It, it's about building personal relationships. And then we're going to go on this journey together. You know, we're, we're going to, when you walk in the door, we're going to do some kind of assessment to see where you're at. And then, you know what? Along the way, we're going to assess and we're going to keep going and we're going to go on this journey together. It, it's, it's a, it's almost like a contract or like a personal relationship, you know, exactly. like, and, and I really want my athletes to understand they're worth more than me than what their baseball stats are. You know, like it, I don't want them to be afraid to text me just because they went over three or three strikeouts, you know, they're, they're worth me than that, you know? Like they're worth way more than me than just your baseball ability. It, it's a personal relationship. It's I'm helping you develop in the long run. And say we get to the finish line and you're like, hey, JV, I don't want to play baseball anymore. That's okay with me. You know, I'm still going to say hi to you. If I see you out and about, I'm going to be like, what's up? I'm going to be like, dude, that guy quit. Forget that. Guy. No. <laughs> like, because then that's putting out that you're only worth to me what you're doing on the baseball field or what you're doing yeah. on the softball field. You know, yeah. like, and kids can't, that's too much pressure to put on a kid, you know? And, and that's just, I want, I just, as long as I'm at Kappa, it will never turn into that. It will always be about relationships. It will always be about journeying together. And it will always be about never us taking credit for the kids success oh you yeah know? we are just the the crazy coaches that are five foot seven that say <laughs> crazy things. And like i always let my clients know i'm honored that you chose me to yeah. go along this journey with you i'm yeah. just honored i get to get a front row seat to your greatness in mm -hmm. a journey i've had clients like get to their senior year and they have plenty of offers to go play in different schools, but like, at, and then they want to go, they don't want to play anymore because they want to pursue a passion in criminology or a passion mm -hmm. in um, kinesiology. And, you know, yeah. like, I'm like, that's cool. That's awesome. Like that. Yeah. I, I helped you kind of find your passion and I created a safe place for you. That wasn't just about results and your baseball skills and your softball skills. Huge. Like, you That's know. huge. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, a personal relationship, not just one that's based off of results. Well, you, you know? created, you created a lifelong mover, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You created somebody that when they're in law school or they're in school for kinesiology, they are going to maintain their health. They're going to be excited mm -hmm. about exercising and maintaining their health. So I think that's really the goal. And then when they become, you know, parents or they become adults beyond that and age into their lives, you know, they're going to benefit from what you, what you do with them now. Right. That's, that's what the science is telling us right now is that what you do with a kid, like you were talking about earlier, there's windows to this, what you do there is impactful for the rest of your life. So, so yeah, it is important what you're doing and like the way that you're talking about developing is something that all parents should be, you know, really valuing and, and feel really special about sending them to you. Right. I don't think there's all the, any, I don't think there's as much money in the world to be able to pay you to be able to do that. That's like incredible and re super rare to find in a coach that somebody even thinks about that. So that is great. That is great stuff you got going on over there, man. Well, it came, yeah, it definitely came from a lot of, I, I didn't just get this way by accident, you know? And like I said, I was that stubborn, cocky coach where like, I don't need to read books. I don't need to go talk to that guy, you know? Yeah. Like, this guy's crawling. What do I need to go talk to that guy crawling over there for? He just crawls. Like, <laughs> Right. Like, <laughs> why am I going to go? What does that guy know about movement? Right. You know, like, so like the reason I always, cause a, a lot of my clients too, they'll be like, how do you know this stuff? Like, whoa. Right. Like, yeah. Cause the, the way, 
the way I teach is, uh, you, you obviously, you know, who Vince Lombardi is right. Like, mm-hmm. so like he, there's a great documentary on him as a coach on HBO that I got to watch. And, um, he uh it's funny as he talks about it. and then you know john madden great yes. coach so madden talks about he went to a coaching clinic that lombardi was putting on and he sat in the back of the room and i'm john madden what what do i need to learn right and like he said lombardi spoke for like hours and hours on one football play <laughs> and he was like i don't know a damn thing about football like he yeah. realized like holy crap you know like yeah and that that happened to me so many times like yeah. once i thought i knew it all you don't Mm-mm. you don't know it all by any means like you 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 gotta always be willing to learn and learn and learn and learn and it's the way lombardi coached was he didn't coach he taught you know like he he didn't just shout terms, you know, Hey, you got to be tougher. Hey, you, you, you got to go stronger than that. Like, or, mm. or if a guy going to want it. A, yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> like jargon, like, right. Yeah. Like motivational quotes, but there's no substance behind it. Right. Don't get me wrong. There, there's a, there's a place and a time for motivational stuff like that. But if I'm just constantly yelling, like you got to want it, you got to be tougher. Like, all right, well, like, are you going to, show me how to hit the ball better like i am tough but i'm still not hitting well so like i made a pact with myself i said when i become a coach i will never coach like that mm-hmm. i will never just shout terms i will be a teacher because that's what lombardi was so i always explain to my clients like look when you go into math class and the teacher writes the problem on the board and say you're in whatever algebra it is right stay with me Jim. So I'm like, with you. I'm with you. <laughs> so, so the teacher writes X plus two equals six, right? right? Does she go, all right, now do it. Or does she explain step by step, right? Mm-hmm. He explains step by step how to do it. So that's how I teach my clients. And when my clients come in here, they're getting a teacher, you know, I'm teaching them step by step, how their body moves, how it works, the sequence of events that happens in a swing the muscles that move, you know, but I'm using it in terms so they can understand. You know, right. I, I learned from Lee Tiger um, and I learned from you too. You were like, hey, JB, not every athlete's a kinesiology major, you know? So when I'm saying disassociation or thoracic spine or, or you know, or pelvis or they don't know what that means, Mm-mm. you know? So you got to, you got to be able to take all this new information you have and find a way to teach it to your athletes in vocabulary that they understand, mm-hmm. you know, because I can't talk to every one of my athletes like they're a kinesiology major or like they're an anatomy major or like they're Jeremy Alvarez, you know, cause they're not. And so I, I became a teacher and I have this huge, like big screen TV and like, I go through step by step, like, and explain to them, all right, this is what the pelvis does and thoracic spine. This is the sequence of events that happens. And like, I really take the time to try to teach it to them. And I want them to, to maybe I can inspire them to get into kinesiology. Maybe mm-hmm. I, they're like, well, this, this stuff's kind of cool. You know, like yeah. you can learn about how the body works. Like, yeah. Like, so I'm just, maybe I can be that catalyst too, where like I can springboard them into wanting to learn more about the body so they can become their own hitting coach, you know, but also they know the why behind everything. So I, I don't want you to do something just because I said it, you know, like I don't want you to do something just because this guy said it on TV, mm-hmm. you know, like I don't want you to do something just because this guru said it on YouTube, you know, there's got to be a reason behind everything we do, you know? And if they, and if we don't have a reason, then why are we doing it? You know, right. and there's got to be conviction and the conviction's got to be there because if you are a really star, say you're, you're this really good sophomore or you're this really good junior or senior in high school, 
and you've talked about this for on your other podcasts, like coaches want to coach you and parents want to coach you and people want to say things and, and other coaches are going to want to put their stamp on you. And like, I'm the guy who made that guy good. So if you don't have conviction and knowledge on what you do and why you do it, now your brain is open to any teaching that anybody will teach you, you know, if you don't have that conviction. So mm-hmm. like if you're hit, say you're a really good golfer and you have all these parents and people around you watching you hit these golf balls. Right. And this coach is like, Hey, you need to hold it like this. If you don't have conviction, like this is why I do it this way, then you're going to listen to him. You're going to go, okay, well, if you say so, I'm going to hold it this way. You don't know if that's good for you or if that's bad for you, you know? So Mm -hmm. I want my athletes to have conviction when they leave me. They like what they do and why they do it. So that way, when I send you out to your college or you go to your, your uh, spring training camp, or you go back to your high schools, if someone asks you, Hey, why do you do it that way? You have an answer for them. Right. You know, you could tell them like, and you know why you do it. And I think the why is very important, you know, cause if you don't know why, like, are you going to be able to repeat it? You know, if you, or should I say the how, like I I ask kids all the time, like they'll smoke a line drive and like, what'd you tell yourself right there? I don't know. Like, what do you you think? Yeah, I just hit it. Right. Yeah. So, but I want them to know the how or like the Mm -hmm. why, because Mm -hmm. now if I know that I'm going to be able to repeat it. I just didn't get lucky and hit it. You know, I know how I did it, you know? So that's something that I kind of been on these last couple of months is like, I've kind of taken on less clients and experimenting with spending more time with my clients, explaining the how and answering any questions they have. Like I want my clients, if they go to school, when they go back to school and the teacher says, I need you to write a how-to book on how to hit a baseball, they could write step-by-step how to hit a baseball, you know? And and that, that helps me out too it helps me sleep better at night knowing like when they leave me, they leave me with not only like bettering their movement patterns, but knowing why their movement patterns got better and knowing the sequence of events that happens when you hit a baseball, you know, or a softball or throw, or, you know, like I want them to have that knowledge and that conviction. Like it's yeah. It lump, watching that Lombardi documentary and being with you. Cause whenever I ask you questions, you're like, you have a reason, like, mm-hmm. and you have substance behind what you teach, you know, mm-hmm. you don't have a lot of jargon, like, and some people might not like you because of that. You, mm-hmm. You're not Mr. Motivator. That's like, yeah, you're doing great. You're going to make me famous. You're doing so great. Like if it's messed up, like you're not afraid to tell them it looks like shit. Yeah. We need to fix something like right. something's going, you know? And I think that's why a lot of kids and your clients and they respect you. Like I've seen at Kappa back when you were working here at Kappa, I've seen athletes that'll wait inside this store. They would wait for two to three hours for you to get here. And I would ask them some of them were pro athletes. And I would ask them, why don't you just go to your trainer? That's, that's part of your, your pro team. No, I don't trust anybody, but Jeremy. I'm like, well, he's not going to be here for like, an hour. that's okay. I'll wait. And I was like, man, <laughs> I, I want that. I want that, that, uh, that loyalty from my clients. Mm-hmm. I want clients to want to be around me that bad, that they're willing to wait two to three hours for my opinion on something, you know? And that really inspired me to see the relationship. Like you weren't just doing the motivational speaking. All right, let's go. You're doing great. You're going to make me famous. Like you were spending time with them. You were building relationships with them and you were journeying alongside them together. And you built this relationship with them where they would wait. Um, I could probably say his name, uh, Renato, Mm. you know, like he came in and he would like, Renato, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm waiting for Jeremy. 
I only trust Jeremy. <laughs> and I'm like, that is, that is so cool. You know, like, dang, like I want that loyalty, you know, like, and I saw that and that's why I just, your athletes love you so much. Like, and I was like, man, dude, like there's a reason why they love you so much. Cause you truly care about their well being. Oh, not yeah. just their, not just their performance on the field. Like you really made Renato feel like you're worth more to me than how many goals you both score, mm-hmm. you know, like, and that was so awesome to witness. And for me to get a front row seat to that and see that before you left me and you divorced me and went to Santa Barbara, <laughs> like it was, it was awesome, you know, to get to see that. And you continue to be a, an inspiration to me. You, will always be the Google of movement to me. You will always be the guy that I go to when I have, when I can't answer the questions that my athletes are questioning. Um, I I have some, some high class clients, you know, like, so I'm going to like, I trust them with you. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to send them to anybody and everybody, you know, like, like I said, like it's their, their livelihoods at stake, you know, it's how they put food on the table. Like, so, and that's one of the reasons why Renato trusts you, you know, like if he doesn't go perform, he doesn't get paid. He can't afford to eat. He can't mm-hmm. make his house payment. He can't, you know, like, so like it's his livelihood at stake. Like, so who am I going to trust that with? And the way right. that athletes trust that with you is this truly inspiring. And I think it's only a testament to not only the coach, but like the person that you are and the relationships that you build. But like, it's yeah. Like I I just, I hope to be on your level someday like that. Like, Oh dude, you're already there. You're already (laughs) there, man. You're already there and and passing it up. And like, (laughs) yeah, all it is is just um, having an open mind. I think caring I think, you know, you hit it on the head, just being passionate about it, um, about what you do, like caring about your craft, right? You're not satisfied just doing the bare minimum, right? Mm -hmm. You're motivated because you love what you do and everything else just kind of falls in place. You know, you're become more interested in learning from other people that are smarter than you. You become, uh, you know, interested in applying these things and, just putting in whatever amount of hours into your craft to get better because you love it. It's not even work. So yeah, and that's one thing you've always ex- resonated with me was like, I've, I've never seen someone with as much passion in what they do in anything in life than you have for movement. <laughs> you are the most passionate person about movement that I have met in my, maybe I would say maybe Ido Portal like my have, but you probably beat him <laughs> on the passion. <laughs> if you guys don't know who Ido Portal is like, that's another guy that I looked up and researched and like, it's movement. I want to learn about movement. That guy is, has a passion for movement, right? Like mm-hmm. maybe he can teach it or say it in a different way. So I wanted to learn from him too. Like, so mm-hmm. like, but you're like, you've always said it's not work for you. Nah. Yeah. Like uh, that is so cool. And like, really isn't. I, I, yeah, I get to come to this facility and help and develop kids get better. To me, the most funnest base, like best game in the world, you know, this isn't a job, you know, but I take it very seriously at the same time. Yes. You know, like I, I, that, and I would say I treat it with the most respect that I can treat that it deserves, you know, like I'm not just taking this for granted. And I know you've, you've talked about that too. Like my parents paid for my education, so I'm not going to go and just screw off. Like I'm going to respect my parents paying for my education and like put in the time and put in the work, like, and you like do it with a smile and you're so happy and energetic and like, Mm -hmm. and what did you, I remember you told me one day too, it was like, you'll never work a day in your life. Like, you know, and like, if you look, look, 
just go to your Instagram page and like you're doing, you're crawling on the beach. You're doing handstands like on a <laughs> on a broken ship in the ocean, like you know, like <laughs> like just living the life, you know, like. But it didn't happen by accident. You didn't get to where you're at without a lot of sacrifice and hard work. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure there was some Friday nights where you wanted to go party, mm-hmm. you know, and you wanted to go hang out with your buddies. But you, you know what? you had to study for a test. They're like, you had to read that book or you had a conference in the morning or you had an FMS like teaching thing that you had to do the next day, you know, Mm -hmm. or you were getting up in the morning to go visit uh, Milo and his facility or Dr. Greg Rose or, Mm -hmm. or Dr. Mo, you know, you made the sacrifices to get to where you got. So like you could enjoy enjoy it, you know, cause sometimes like, like you and Juan talked about me on the podcast last time, like on how you guys met. And I looked at my wife, I'm like, these are two guys that are like going to get like PhDs and doctorates and probably degrees past doctorates and degrees past, like they're going <laughs> to like, and they're talking about, and they're talking about me. Yeah. I'm, I'm nobody, you yeah. know, like, these two guys are talking about me, coach JB. I'm nobody. Right. Well, like, you know how you said he's created yeah. an environment for the athletes to develop and get better. We well, created an environment for us to show up and even meet. So yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was this cool to have two very distinguished, intelligent gentlemen, dudes, like bring me up in a conversation. And my wife like reminded me, it was like, you know, like you belong in that conversation. Mm -hmm. You've you've worked hard too. Oh, you have a good wife. And like, you don't, (laughs) she always like, you don't think Jeremy wants to hear what you have to say too. Mm -hmm. You don't think Juan wants like your take and he wants like to know what you think about too, you know, like it's a two way street, you know, Mm -hmm. like, but I am just forever like, always feeling like I'm playing catch up to like you and Juan and Dr. Mo. And well, that's not uh, always the worst feeling, by the way, like, yeah, like you kind of want to feel like, yeah. And, and that's what you're doing, by the way, that's like the main philosophy with the crock pot versus microwave thing mm-hmm. is that, uh, these kids that get cooked fast in the microwave, they lose that feeling of like, I'm behind, I'm behind, I'm behind. Mm-hmm. And they've been, they're winning every tournament. They're winning every game. They're the MVP. You know, they lose that motivation to put in this, the same amount of work at the right time. And, uh, and they end up getting burnt out, you know, and the other kids that are like, damn it, I'm going to catch him. I'm going to catch him. Right. And then when they finally do, they're at like at the appropriate age to just peak and get ready, you know, they've been slow cooking. So um, anyways, that, can apply to sports. It can apply to really anything. Yeah. This over here too, you know? So and you always, you always gave me a quote all the time. You always get, and I, and I always ask you like to like, what was that quote you told me? And it was something about like percentage of gold medal athletes. Oh like, yeah. Like, yeah. And like you, t- and I'm like, man, that is. And like, when I tell that the parents too, it's like, like, you know, and I, I think a lot of it is, as a society, we compare ourselves to the anomalies. So we compare ourselves to um, LeBron James, LeBron James, <laughs> Tiger Woods, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, you know, like, yeah. and we, or Bryce Harper or Mike Trout, you know, Bryce Harper was on the cover of Sports Illustrated at like 16 or in high yeah. school, right? Like, and uh, he would play all these travel ball tournaments and like, we we take ourselves or our kids and we compare them to those anomalies you know and and we forget that those are anomalies you know yep. like those are those are freaks you know mm-hmm. like um genetically physically like everything you know those are those are freak athletes you can't take your eight-year-old son and compare them to LeBron <laughs> James or no. Mike Trout or Bryce Harper you know no. and it's you know, be, being in this business for a while too now, I've been doing this since I was 
16 years old, like it, it's really hard to predict the future. You just, you just never know, you know, you may get this eight year old in here and he is freaking hitting balls that are going through the nets, but you don't know when he goes through puberty, like if he's going to, no one has like this magic crystal ball where they can predict the future. And yeah. that's a thing that like Bob, um, one of the, the coaches I, I listen to follow a lot. He talks about like, you know, you, you can't predict the future in it. And if you go to a coach and he says, well, if you come to me um, and buy this lesson package and play on my travel team, I'll make him the next Cristiano Ronaldo. Mm -hmm. I'll make him this. Like if a coach tells you that, then you need to ask him for proof. Like <laughs> show me, show me an eight year old that you had and you took that eight year old and took him all the way from eight years old to the champions league. Yeah. Like, you know, like if you're going to, say stuff like that, you better show me proof. Right. right. Well, and what I've learned in, in my day and age, cause I've had really good eight year olds and then they don't, sometimes they don't end up making their varsity baseball team. Mm -hmm. And I've had eight year olds who I thought would end up quitting baseball and go on to get drafted someday, you know? So it's like, you just never know. So the worst thing you can do is just start to assume this kid's going to be this and this kid's going to be that just work on development and whatever happens is going to happen. You mm -hmm. know, like it's, you can't force it. It's just like Tiger Woods dad said, like you never instill anything into a child. You should just encourage the development of it. So the whole time at the youth level, you're just encouraging their development. Yeah. Just encourage, 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 encourage. And whatever happens is gonna happen mm -hmm. you know like we we can't predict the future and we can't say well if he does this and this he's gonna be this we don't know you know it's movement is so complex sports are so just hard they're really hard you know like if you go to a professional soccer game and you watch those guys play, who's the the guy from France, uh, M Mbappe? Oh yeah, oh, that guy is so fast. Yeah, have you seen that guy dribble a soccer ball down the field and have control of it at the same time? Mm -hmm. Like, and you're comparing your eight year old son to that guy? Like, Not like go happen. yeah, go watch those guys play. And you realize that's a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah. You know, like yeah. professional, go watch a professional baseball game and go get there early for batting practice. Those guys are hitting baseballs like this far above the ground and almost putting like a hole in the outfield wall, like how hard they're hitting it. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, like you go watch LeBron James warm up and listen to him dunk the ball. And I want you to count how many strides it takes from LeBron to get the one side of the court to the other side of the court. Mm -hmm. Le Le LeBron James grabs a basketball like this. This is <laughs> the basketball, right? And then he throws it over him. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. And you're comparing your kid to that. Like that's not, first of all, it's not fair. It's not fair to your kid, you know, mm -hmm. to compare him to that, you know, or, and that's, I think where that book range really comes in handy for parents to, it's a great read. Um, very informational. It changed my view on a lot of things, you know, and it's gotta be more about development. Quit trying to predict the future because you can't, you never know what the kids are going to be like, what they're going to turn into, if they're still going to be interested, you know, mm -hmm. um, let them play as many sports as they can encourage them to develop, don't put so much pressure on them where they end up quitting and they hate it. And what breaks my heart, Jeremy, the most is getting parents and kids that feel like they're falling behind. Oh yeah. When they, when they like, well, you know, I'm not going to this tournament here and I'm not going. So I must be falling behind. Mm -hmm. And that just breaks my heart when I hear that, like you're, you're not falling behind. You yeah. Know? No, you're not, you know, like, uh, Boyle has a great analogy where um, he 
they put on like a, a timer on hockey players at hockey tournaments where like how long they had the puck for. So if you take your kid to a tournament and um, they play a hockey tournament, like he may only have the puck for two minutes, you know? So like hockey is like fast, right? Like I get the puck. I turn it, it over. Yeah. yeah that, like, pass it. So yeah. So for a total of puck time, like, I don't remember what he said, but it was really small. We'll say like two to three minutes for the whole tournament. So you, your kid had the puck for like two to three minutes and you could use it for soccer too. Like how long in soccer do you actually have the ball, your possession mm -hmm. before you shift it off? Like if I added up how long you have the ball for the whole soccer tournament, it's not going to be very long, you know? Yeah. And so tournaments are not very expensive. So say you go to Santa Cruz, right? Say you go to uh, Santa Barbara because you're familiar with Santa Barbara. How much are hotels in Santa Barbara? Very expensive. Right? <laughs> say, like, I have to get three nights stay in Santa Barbara. How much would that cost me? Huh. That's going to be 900 to a, a okay. grand. Yeah. yeah. So we'll say a thousand, right? Because yeah. of, of inflation and everything that's going on right now. <laughs> so we'll say it's a thousand. Okay. Now, I got to buy food for that whole entire time. So how much do you think that is? Three days. We're talking yeah. kids. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, that's probably going to be, yeah, two probably. I mean, your family, 60, probably like, it's at least like $60 a meal. So mm -hmm. about $120 a day yeah, so at, the, at the minimum. For each person. So that's three times that by three, then times that by three. And so now like, okay, we'll, we'll just say 1500. We're at 1500. Okay. Right. I'm not a mathematician. Okay. So let's say 1500. And then now, okay. Add gas. How much is gas to get there? Oh, and, back? Super and you're, expensive. and you're driving to the, the place and back. So we'll say it's a $2,500 weekend. Right. Yeah. And we'll say your kid's the best player on that soccer team. Okay. Right. And you're guaranteed three to four soccer games. Right. So you just paid $2,500 for your kid to touch the ball for like two minutes a game. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're, if you go to a baseball tournament, they guarantee you three games. Say your kid's the best player on that, on that team. Right. And he's going to get every at bat. So you just paid $2,500 for six at bats. Yeah. And he might get what, like two or three balls hit to him on defense. Right. But you paid $2,500 for, for a couple balls hit to him on defense <laughs> and, and six at bats. Mm -hmm. Is it, So it's like, and Boyle just really goes over this. Like, is more games really the answer? Mm -hmm. You know, is kids playing more tournaments and more games really the answer? When... I don't like, I don't know how much you charge for your training, but like our lessons here are $40 for 40 minutes, you know? So in 40 minutes, that kid gets to swing the bat uh, 250 to like 300 times, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. Like bucket after bucket after bucket. So it's like, it, it's just, it is, is more games and more tournaments really the answer, you know, yeah. like you're paying $2,500 for six at bats and he may get three balls hit to him on defense, like crazy, right? To like, mm -hmm. think about, you know, and parents are doing this every weekend. And like, is this really the solution or is this hurt? Is this hurting the development or is this helping the development of our youth? You know? Yeah, exactly. Like this whole travel ball industry and tournaments, because there's a tournament every weekend for any sport at any time. If you want to play a tournament Christmas morning, there's a tournament somewhere. <laughs> There's a travel ball tournament somewhere, you know, oh, yeah. they'll, they'll call it the, the Christmas classic or something, right? Yeah. Uh, there's, and it's soccer, baseball, like my nephews play soccer. They go to Dallas, they go all over. Like, so there's soccer tournaments every weekend too. There's baseball tournaments every weekend too, you know, but I, I just don't like when parents look at that and they're like, I'm, I'm not doing enough for my kid. Cause they're not playing in a tournament every right. week, you know? And that breaks my heart. And I really hope like parents can hear this and know, like understand just because your kid is not playing in a travel ball tournament every weekend, or I don't care if it's soccer or basketball, he's not falling behind. I mm -hmm. promise. You know, there's no guarantees. Like 
when the Lakers drafted Kobe Bryant, I highly doubt they were like, Hey man, like when you were eight years old and you play in that AAU tournament, like how many points did you score? And did you guys win that tournament? Yeah. Like they don't care. Right. No. Like you think when like Mike Trout got drafted, they were like, Hey man, when you were eight years old and you played in that fourth of July tournament, did you go three for four or four for four? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, right and like no. you know like so like i i just think more emphasis like more more attention needs to be put on development rather than winning tournaments and trophies at a young age and that's been really something i've had to learn and dr greg rose has really taught me that with golf tournaments like if you push your kid to win a golf tournament you might lose out on the developmental side you know, mm -hmm. like it, it shouldn't be all be about winning all these, these youth golf tournaments rather than helping them develop. You know, if you're sacrificing development for results right now, then probably not on the right track. You yeah. Know? I mean, you certainly, like, like you, you said, certainly, you certainly gonna quit. Like, or, yeah, exactly. You're going to burn out. You, you yeah. certainly still want to compete. Yeah. You and I'm really still want to win. Yeah. But it's just that when you don't win, you know, you're, you're not, don't think of it as a loss. Right. And, um, and that, and that's pretty much it. Like you're still, so you're still coaching your kid and mm -hmm. wanting them to win. Right. You, that's still the prize, but the motivation, the, the real win is the long run and the kids aren't always going to see that. And especially parents, they're not always going to see that either, mm -hmm. but you can create other ways to create motivation, right? Oh, you almost had him next time you'll get him. Yeah. Right. And then you see him that same person you compete against at the next tournament or next game or whatever. And you're like, there he is, there he is, there he is. Okay. Let's get him. Let's get him. We're going to get him today. Yeah. Right. And it's like five years later, it's like, you're better than him. You got him. Right. So you won. That's the type of win you want to have. Exactly. And when I was at Fresno world of baseball, we did travel ball teams. And it was like, we were like, man, we're going to make this all about development. You know, we're young guys. You don't have kids on the team. Um, and so we had, we had a, a, an eight-year-old team, a nine-year-old team, a 10-year-old team, and I think at 12. So you have four teams. And there was like 12 sets, so 48 guys, 12 guys on each team, right? Mm -hmm. Out of those 48 guys, and this is when I first started out when I was like, probably like 18, 19 and I was helping a guy run these travel ball teams. Right. And, um, our goal was all about development. We're, we're not going to win tournaments. We're going to develop, you know? So we thought like, man, we're going to create these, these awesome athletes that are like one day going to thank us because they were in college or got drafted, you know? So out of those 48 players, how many of those do you think made their varsity baseball team? Yeah, seriously. How, how many, if you had to take a guess. So out of those 48 that, that we had, how many of those 48 think grew up to make their varsity baseball team? Half. We'll say half. The well, third. Well, three. 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 Wow. Right? Wow. Three. And it's, like I said, it's so hard to predict the future. It's yeah. so hard to say that kid's going to do this or that kid's going to do that, you know, because I don't know, like puberty does weird, you know, more than me, like puberty does weird things to kids sometimes, like sometimes it helps them. Sometimes it throws them for a whirl, you know, like, <laughs> like I have kids that'll come in and all of a sudden they'll have like facial hair and their face is cracking and they're like, they were the best athlete ever, you know? Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden they go through puberty and they're tripping over their feet and they're like, they're lanky and they're all in coordinate. Like it is totally like through their body for a whack, but, yeah. but before puberty, they mastered their body type. They mastered their height and weight. So they were the, they were ballers, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, well I wake up and all of a sudden I'm two to three inches taller now. Like, Oh, now I got to try to remaster my swing and my yeah. agility yeah. throws your agility off. Like, you know, like, so that's why like 
if I could give any advice to young coaches or I could do things differently, if I could go back and change anything, I would not worry so much about making these perfect little athletes. Like even on that travel ball team, man, like I wanted their, their technique to be so good. Cause I thought, you know, like they're going to go on to make their varsity baseball team someday. Like, Like, and I would like worry way less about perfection and how it looks and way more about the long-term development. And you ask me, well, what is long-term development? Well, it's speed and power. That's what it is. You know, guys, uh, if you, if you watch golf right now, guys are hitting the ball faster and farther than ever before. Right. Like they can't make golf courses long enough for golfers. Right. Like, yeah. And the guys coming up behind them are like Dr. Greg Rosas are only hitting it faster and farther. Mm-hmm. So the future of the game is even farther. Okay. Wow. Who, who are the guys in the big leagues in baseball that make the most money? They're the guys who hit the ball really far. They're the guys that can throw the ball really hard. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and soccer, who are the best soccer players? The slow ones or the fast ones? Definitely the speed kills, man. Yeah. Speed kills. Yeah, right. The fast one. So, like, mm-hmm. if you want, all right, what does development mean? You know, for me, it means you better be if you want to become an elite athlete, and that's your goal, right? Like, I wanna, I wanna be in, uh, I wanna be in the Champions League someday. I wanna be in the MLS, or uh, is it still called the Premier League in England? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Premier League, you know, or I want to play in the La Liga, or I want to play in the MLB, or I want to be on the PGA Tour someday. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, these are some things that you should prioritize to get there. You should be really fast. Okay. You should be able to swing fast and throw fast. Like, if you can't do those, you might make it, but you're not going to be successful. Like, yeah. it's, it's so much sports are becoming about speed and power and how fast and explosive athletes like, so at a young age, when we're talking about development, that's what should be prioritized. You know, um, like I've seen my brother sent me this video the other day and he's like, what do you think about this drill? And they had kids balancing on a beam, hitting baseballs, like Mm -hmm. young kids. Right. And I'm like, "I I don't know about that because for, in his mind to balance on that beam, what's he going to do? He's going to slow his swing down. Yeah. Right. So he can balance on that beam. So am I helping him develop or am I helping just master his swing right now? I, in my eyes, that's hindering his development, Mm -hmm. you know, because he's trying to be so careful so he can stay on that beam. When you ever go to TPI and you watch Dr. Greg Rose train people, his kids do ballerina spins and fall down. Like, or you go to uh, Milo's place, like, dude, those kids are, they do a 360, like they're hitting, like, and you know what he says? Great job. You gave me maximum effort, do it again. Like, and that's what we should be doing for our young athletes is not demanding perfection, but helping them for their future selves to mm-hmm. develop speed and power. So right. I don't know. I think that's a good I note. Think development. That's what I, you think too. Like, so I don't know if we're on the same page there. I think it's a good note to end on this, yeah. that development is. Cause what does it mean? You know, like, Oh, we, we, we're all about development. Well, what is development? Well, like, you know, there's a recent literature that I've been reading through to discover the true meaning of physical literacy. And more books. Um, yes. And they've actually <laughs> come up with a definition that everybody agrees on, which is great. And so that was the first step, first major step to answer, you know, what is development? Yeah. And so um, in summary, right? Yes, it involves speed and, and, and those things. But I think we've, we've talked about it already and we've hit on it. It also, it, it involves a person as a whole. It involves their cognitive and their mental health just as much as their physical health. And we both know that plays a big role in a person's motivation to even want to train speed, right? To even want to play stupid sports, right? Like it's, it's, it's about that. 
and what is entailed in in this whole person is also yes they're mental and they're physical but also that over time so we're talking about through a lifetime so physical literacy is not just a kid learning this stuff it's not just a pro athlete it's not just a normal person going to work every day it's the person every year of their life all the way until the end of their life that is physical literacy that is development and that's really what we're looking at so if you take a step back and you just get rid of sports right that's really what we're trying to do right there is is get people active for lives but that's a good note yeah, to end on like i would the, say um development is like we're worried more about your long term than mm-hmm. short, you know like, yeah the crock pot was a great example man. yeah and i think you you exactly hit on that um what what i would like i don't know do you have like a comment section on this thing like <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I would ask, like, what I would like to know, too, is what I'm trying to research is, like, we have this window of opportunity, and this is what I would like to end on, like, and, like, what do other coaches think? Like, I definitely would love to learn from other coaches, too, you know? It's like, so we have this window of opportunity to teach speed and power. At what age, chronologically or biologically, or when do we drive a wedge in there and say, all right, you need to learn technique. Yes. It's time for you to start learning some technique now. You yes. Know? That can't let you go like a caveman and swing hard and do a ballerina and spin every time. And the ball's going 60 yards left and 60 yards. Right. So like at what age, like, do we stop and say, all right, now it's time for technique training. You, you've done mm-hmm. enough speed and developmental and power training, but at what age do we drive that wedge in there and say, all right, now it's time for your technique training. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it right after uh, puberty? Is it 18 years old? Is it 15 years old? No. How, how long do we let them swing as hard as they want? You know, yeah. before, well, we, before we slow them down. Well, first we need to do what we've already done, which is establish a definition that everybody agrees on. Yeah. And then you need to establish a gold standard measurement. Mm -hmm. And then, because there's a couple of organizations out there that have, it's pretty awesome, actually. They've developed some great curriculums and some great measurement tools. Problem is that although they agree on the definition of physical literacy, they their actual program of what it entails is slightly different from each other. So it's like, okay, what is the gold standard for that? And I think that's what you're asking right now. And that's what we're still trying to learn ourselves is what is gold standard, meaning what is the CDC saying? What is, you know, the NIH saying? What is, you know, all these systematic reviews and the professionals in this field, their knowledge together, Mm -hmm you know, what are they coming to the conclusion as uh, the gold standard of what age, as you described, yeah. should they learn a certain skill and things like that? So more to come on that, yeah, which is exciting. Sequence in everything we do. Um, uh, do you know who Xander Shoffley is? He's a golfer. Um, I do he not. Just, he just won the gold medal for us in golf. And uh, his dad is a track coach. And his dad is take track coaching principles and teaching him to play golf. And the track athletes are all about that window of opportunity, you know, like this develops speed and power, you know, Mm -hmm. running faster there. And like, I just, I, I always wonder too, like, man, like when, when is the right time, you know, to like slow this athlete down or to go technique and like, with a coach like that, like with him and his dad, like when did, like with Justin Thomas and his dad, when, or Dr. Greg Rose, you know, he's developed more athletes than probably anybody on this world. Like, how do you know when is the right time to step in and like slow them down? And like, because it's an advantage to be a late bloomer. We know that, but when do we step in and Mm -hmm. get that intervention with, technique without sacrificing their their long-term development are we stepping in too early 
Mm-hmm. Did we miss the window? Are we stepping in too late? You know, or is there such a thing as too early or too late? You know, so yeah, I, I definitely can't wait to talk about that in the future. And I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna do a thousand more of these. And oh yeah, you're gonna be big. Like I just, I've always told you, just, just don't forget about me when you're famous. <laughs> just at least say hi to me, like, or uh, <laughs> let me come kick it at your Santa Barbara mansion that you have. Because you know? <laughs> like, you're you're gonna be you're gonna be huge, and uh, and it, it everybody knows about you at here at Kappa because they they ask me like, where'd you learn that, or like, how do you know that? And I was Jeremy Alvarez. Yeah, you just put a picture of me up there. I know, by the, like, I by just the front door. Me, How do you know that? <laughs> Jeremy Alvarez. Well, who's Jeremy Alvarez? Like, you know, mm-hmm. and then like when you make it big and this freaking podcast blows up, they're gonna be like, dude, that's the Jeremy Alvarez that JP was talking about. Like, so like everybody knows you at Capit here. Like, because awesome, it's so man. funny. I get a lot of questions all the time, like, dude, like, how do you even know that stuff? Um, I have Jeremy Alvarez to call and talk to and <laughs> he'll sit there and answer all my questions for me. Like, yeah. You know, like, so yeah. certainly you, man, you're, you're it? greatly appreciated. And this was awesome, Jeremy. And, um, I hope, you know, man, like you are, you, you're, you're changing lives. You're changing society for the better, man. Like people love you. Like people love being around you. Like I said, there's clients that would wait two to three hours for you to get here and be done. Um, There's a reason, man, like athletes stay loyal to you, you know? And there's a reason why you've gotten the opportunities you've gotten. And um, you you truly are the Google of movement. Like that's (laughs) your your new name. I like that phrase, man. I like that phrase. Yeah. You like, if you guys, anybody out there have a question, ask this guy right here. But, I like that. <laughs> and he'll, he'll try to get back to you as soon as he can. But um, I would say get to him before he blows up. Like, <laughs> he's going he's gonna to get big. He's going to be the next Dr. Greg Rose or Gray Cook or, or like there's going to be a professional team that's going to snag you or an organization, a school district something somebody's gonna snag you man like you're Mm -hmm. you're just way too valuable and you're and you're such a great person and um you have such great integrity that's why your athletes love you you Mm -hmm. know um you're thank you thank you yeah and everything that you say has substance has meaning behind it and you just you truly care about the future of this world and and our youth man like so Mm -hmm. Um, truly, I hope, I hope you know that you're, you're greatly appreciated man, in thank more ways you. than you know. So I appreciate that everybody yeah. listening. Thank you for staying in to hear us talk and, um, see you at future episodes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.